OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Whatever you grow, we'll save a bro. Right, half past seven, Monday morning. Nathan is with us. Nathan, good morning to you. Good morning, Chair. Let's get straight into it. Uh, well, a fairly busy, storied, interesting, varied weekend uh, on many fronts. Do we start with the start of the? Do we start with the bad story in the front of the Daily Star this morning? Holy Jesus! Man grabs GEA kid nine in brackets by throat. Shocked mum sees attacker walk onto pitch. So this is like, I'd say you were at an under nine game over the weekend. I was at, I was at four kids games over yeah. the weekend and uh, thankfully we all managed to get through them. Uh, despite frustrations at times uh, with, you know, maybe your own players and the opposition players, uh, everyone managed to get through it by accepting that we're watching an under nine game. Yeah, anybody and, uh, grabbed any kids. Life and everyone uh, gave the little fist pump at the end and applauded each other and moved on with our lives. They, um, they click sticks in the, in the hurling or the camogie. Um, the star has established the man is alleged to have grabbed the defensive kid by the throat during a hurling blitz in Tipperary on Saturday afternoon. Afternoon. It's not like you've been, you know, uh, anyway, not like you've been drinking all day. It's, uh, it's like you haven't had time. Uh, Guardia Thurlis were alerted shortly after 1pm on Saturday the 15th of October following an incident of alleged assault at a sports event in Thurles. This is a Garda spokesman. Inquiries are ongoing. As the incident involves young persons, on Garda Shiacona will not be commenting further at this time. However, sources uh, speaking to Michael O'Toole, our crime correspondent, says the alleged victim did not require any medical treatment following the incident and nobody's been arrested as of late last night. The blitz was organised by the Munster GAA and a spokesman for that organisation confirmed it was aware of the incident and was carrying out its own investigation. What the hell is going on? Uh, this is insanity. I, I just can't even imagine the situation, and I can't imagine being well, in the position that the children's parents are in well, or the what happens? mentors. Yeah, how, how, how does, you know, how, how does the, how do you, like... Well, I think yeah, it's the last thing in your mind. Right? Everybody wants to de-escalate the situation, but how does somebody get away with it? Like, that what they do you... just walk away. What are you doing? You know. Unless you're there, it's hard to know exactly how it plays out. Firstly, if, if a adult walks onto a pitch of a kid's game, you assume that somebody's injured or they're going to fix a helmet or uh, they're there to help. You don't assume that they're going to assault the child. And then that they somehow, it seems, walk off the pitch. Now, we don't know all the details and they present themselves uh, to the guards that evening. Yeah, I, this is like beyond disgraceful. And, you know, we've spoken a lot about abuse of referees and we've spoken a lot about uh, people encroaching on pitches uh, over recent weeks and recent months and recent years. And it feels like we've been talking about it forever. But this brings it to a whole new level. Like, firstly, you have to hope that the nine-year-old kid uh, is okay and isn't overly traumatised by this. Do you know, like, no, no medical attention required, but, like, uh, an adult comes and grabs you by the neck uh, who isn't, who you know, like, while you're playing sport and having crack. Like, it's horrific, really. It is absolutely horrific. And it's just, it comes off the back of last week's, you know, respect campaign. And it's, just, I don't know. I, I don't know what to do in a situation like this. Like, it, but it, well, what do you do? Like, so it's with the guards now. So you have to hope that action will be taken there. But well, what, what happens to the club? Lifetime ban. So like, a lifetime the, ban, but... Does the club get thrown out? And then are you punishing all the other that's, kids? That's the other, that, isn't that always the argument that's put forward? That... This is one individual who has well, maybe taken you take this them, step. Maybe you take them out of like you, you take them out of competition. You know the, the punishment is so severe that for this year your team is allowed to play all the league games, but you're not allowed to play championship underage. No one in the club is playing championship underage this year. Tough luck, right? Police it properly. Take it seriously. You can't do that. You can't. You can't be blaming all the rest of the lads for it. It's like, well, okay, Grant. Let's let's continue with the same scenario. It's the same situation where referees are getting chased, followed. Uh, escaping from matches and boots of cars. Now you have grown men, and it is a man, coming on to a child's game, grabbing the child by the throat. But you can't, you know, you can't, can't hold the club responsible. Who else is going to be responsible? Well, you're right. And zero tolerance is the only way to go with this. And then you have a ripple effect where around the country it's made very clear that if anybody misbehaves, that your entire club will suffer the consequences or that team will suffer the consequences as it happens if it's a player. Like, if a player is playing a match and they get sent off, you often cost your team a game. You cost them a championship. That's the punishment. Nobody goes, ah, well, it's a little bit unfair in a game of this importance. We'll just yeah. leave them on the pitch. Bring somebody else on. So very quickly, it would get around the country and I'd imagine you would have a lot of meetings at the start of the year saying you are on the sideline as a supporter, 
you are representing this club. And if you do anything that brings the name of this club into disrepute, we're all going to suffer. We're all going to be thrown out of this competition. We're all going to be banned from playing matches. So maybe, maybe that gets into people's heads. But listen, this is an under nine blitz. It's a bit of crack. Like, there's thousands of these happening every single week. There should be no real emotion or anger involved from anybody in it. It's not a senior championship game where people can get a little bit worked up. Like it's there to help them to learn. Uh, yeah, people can get a bit frustrated at times. Yeah, it can be a bad challenge at times. But they're kids. Like they're, you know, yeah, you have a word with them. If it's uh, particularly bad, maybe their mentor takes them off the pitch and you know, they need to be taught a bit of a lesson and say that's unacceptable. But for somebody to walk on to a pitch and do this is... Yeah. It's beyond belief. It is. It when is. I read this yesterday, I was like, like, how? How does this happen? It is beyond belief. It's uh, 7.36 this morning. You're watching OTB AM. We're brought to you by Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Here's what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock this morning. Performance rankings are imminent. Mike Carlson's going to look back on... Uh, last night's NFL, where it turns out uh, the Buffalo Bills got a bit of revenge on the Chiefs. Samuel Luckhurst is going to talk to us about Man United. We've got sports pages for you, rounding up all of the GAA action. Um, uh, big, big win in Dublin. Big, big win in Kilkenny. Um, some of the superpowers got toppled around the rest of the country as well. Alan Quinn is going to join us in studio. Once we're back, baby. And then Paul Galvin's going to join us in studio this morning as well as we talk about his new book. But at 7.37, time for the Gillette Labs performance rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is we've just lacked that intensity. Uh, usual caveat before this uh, starts. I don't agree with everything that Nathan says. That's all. Just getting that out there. Uh, usual caveat. Cullen forces me to put some of these things in there. So just, you know, <laughs> talk about them at some stage. <laughs> well, listen, if we're all throwing each other under the bus on a Monday morning... Why should I stop? Uh, all right, let's start in the red. Uh, Connacht rugby, very harsh. And Connacht, who put up a brave display against Leinster on Friday night, uh, beaten 10 0. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hone in on the zero. Like, another night, Connacht probably would have kicked a few penalties, but were going for corners, going for territory, trying to get themselves a try to really give themselves an opportunity to win the game. And nothing quite worked out. It, it wasn't that dissimilar to the week before against Munster, where like, they won the game, but they should have absolutely taken Munster to town and missed an awful lot of chances and they just weren't particularly convincing any time they went into the Leinster half it did feel a little bit at times like it was men against boys that you knew all of Leinster's experience would count and that Connacht would make a mistake and time and time again just when Connacht were inside the 22 the ball was turned over Leinster were able to produce a big play at the right time yeah, and get like, out of danger. there's one specific break that leads to the last penalty that takes Connacht out of losing bonus point territory, and uh, there, there's a like a bit of an incident at the ruck. Josh van der Fleer makes 60 yards, mm. and then the penalty gets conceded, and the penalty gets kicked, and it's like ball game at that stage. Like at that stage, that like they were at a, they had an attacking platform, and they all kind of stopped thinking, well, we're going to get a penalty here, and they didn't get the penalty, and. Uh, you know, that's that's a massive shift in the result of the game. So it's a bit of a sliding doors moment. Now, the better team won. They have better players. They have a much, much bigger budget. I think Connacht losing by 10 points to Leinster, it's not really uh, the worst performance they're ever going to have. Like No, they, they had enough to keep them in the game. They just didn't have enough to win it. So in the first half, actually, when, when Leinster were playing very well, like Connacht were very resilient. They got a couple of really important turnovers. Uh, from a couple of lineouts, you know, defended valiantly on their own line. It was just when they went up the other end and they needed that extra bit of quality or a bit of composure they were lacking. But maybe that's every team when you go up against this Leinster side. It's not like playing anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully Leinster's performance is a harbinger of um, them clicking into that level of gear. Because like the previous week, they put up, what, 45 points against a good quality South African side at home. So, um, you know... I'm, I'm not throwing Connacht under the bus here, but I can see why they would be in the red. I'm sure they're very disappointed about it. Um, well, it's one win, in, one win now in five. What's notable is that Munster are not in the red. We will get to them a little bit later, and we'll do yeah. plenty of, of uh, celebration, I suspect, from Alan Quinlan, about the, or relief more than celebration, I think, about the quality of the performance they put in. And, and where the quality was coming from, it was the kids, and it was like, right, whew, whew, okay. But we should also mention Ulster going to South Africa and winning... And uh, Mike Larry, he's very good. 
it's like it's just going to be one of those careers that is on the fringe of being incredibly important for Ireland but maybe not getting the opportunities or or he's going to make it all the way and if he does then we're going to be very exciting to watch for the next five, six, seven years. Yeah, you could be in the position where you know Hugo Keenan does a Rob Carney and gets another six, seven years at full back and nobody ever gets an opportunity. I, I, is the jury still out, Luster? It feels like it's not but then we're still two months away from Champions Cup. Like they need to be getting yeah. consistently to Champions Cup semi-finals, finals. Yeah, look, and um, you know they've, their big money signing isn't coming until after the World Cup. And you're like, wow, that's great. The World Cup's imminent, and it's like it's not really imminent. Like the, rugby uh, transfers are a dangerous business, aren't they? Um, like, with the amount of injuries, signing somebody and saying, "Yeah, see in a year's time, pal." Yeah, yeah. yeah. After yeah. you play the most attritional tournament there could be. Yeah. We'll yeah. Come here fresh and ready. Yeah. For a lot of money, I mean, look. Um, yeah, I like. I think it's a big opportunity for them this season. Like they, largely, most of their players are coming back to fitness. I mean, obviously, you really hope that Stockdale. Uh, the, I haven't seen the diagnosis in the latest ankle injury, but how bad it's going to be. And you'd always always have concerns about Henderson's injury profile. But if you know, if by and large they can have a, a season where their best players aren't out for five, six, seven months and are actually playing together a bit, um, they've got an incredibly exciting backline. That's the thing that I think is going to make sure that um, Ravenhill's full every Friday night. They got La Rochelle in the Champions Cup. It'll be a good game, you know. Happy to see. It'll be interesting. Right, that's that's the first one in red. What else? Sorry, Jer. I, I think you probably agree with this one. Do you? Aston Villa. Back in the red, though Steven Gerrard said it was an outstanding performance. Well, against Chelsea, yesterday. it was it was a much better performance, right? Like they were, they were unlucky in that uh, very good chances were missed, and they had a goal mess scramble almost as good as the Republic of Ireland women's team against Scotland, where you're like, go, it's gonna be goal, no, it, it's coming now, no, it's gonna happen now. Oh Jesus, how did it not happen? Uh, look, Chelsea weren't very good. Villa were better than I expected them to be. I wouldn't have been terribly surprised if it had finished one all. It probably would have been a fair result. I think the XG was definitely in Villa's favour. Um, ah, well then, give them the points now. Well, Nathan, this, when you're reduced to the XG to defend your team, I'm not. I I I, I don't want Steven Gerrard as the manager long term. I'm not actually here to. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. But I think that like uh, credit where it's due, it was a better performance than I expected. I actually, I actually expected them to get rolled over. 3-0 and not create any chances but they did create chances and they did seem to have like he dropped Coutinho you know fair enough looked like he was having difficulty doing that on a consistent basis that whenever he kind of needed something or felt like he needed the big moments in the game and the way he talks about it is always big moments oh I need big moments for my big players like actually you don't you need a style of play and a philosophy and a belief system and you need to create chances you need to have an idea about how those chances are going to be created like Tyrone Mings makes a mistake for the first one and then the second one they're blaming Emmy Martinez but like it is one of those ones where the ball moves in the middle of the, of the I air. It's a cracking like, free kick. So, like, you know. Cracking job. Uh, I actually don't think this is the worst it's been for Villa and the atmosphere wasn't as toxic as it might have been I think because they created chances. Well they created a lot of chances. Like Chelsea had to make a double substitution at the break because they were getting cut open so often and maybe it's a different game if Chilwell gets sent off like it was a really, really bad tackle on Ramsey in the first half, like you need those sort of decisions to go in your favour when you're playing a team of Chelsea's quality. So yeah, they created chances, but what is it, one win in seven now? Like they need to turn this around quickly. And a lot of these clubs, I'm sure, you know, probably the likes of Southampton as well, are wondering, like, do we go before the international break? And then you give that manager a month on the training ground where you know, a lot of the players will be there, the vast majority of players will be there? Or do you hope that they can somehow turn around over the winter break and I don't come know. back in December fully I, you, refreshed? You get rid of them if you've got a much better option. That's the, like, it can't just be knee-jerk. Okay, who's available now? They have to have a plan in place to go, okay, we have agreed backroom team, we have agreed cost, we have agreed transfer strategy with the next manager, whoever that might be. Or there's like a world-class young coach, the next Graham Potter is out there somewhere and they're like, okay, we have our eyes on this guy. You would expect Christian Perzo has been around football for a long time to know who the best young coaches in world football are and also who the superpower managers are who might be like, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this project but I want full control over this or this is going to be the person who um, uh, scouts and recruits for me. Well, uh, the next three games would surely say a lot. They've got Fulham away on Thursday night. They play Brentford at home next Sunday and then they've got Newcastle away before they take on Manchester United. Like, those Fulham games, that game against Fulham and Brentford, like, you need four points from them. You do. And, uh, you know. Uh, Tennis Tank says, good thinking, fellas. There should be zero tolerance. This is uh, about 
I mean, really, you know, um, people going onto the sideline should be in the performance rankings, but it's kind of too serious in a way for us, uh, maybe even, I don't know. Um, the big news, say, Jared, at least some people go onto the sideline, they'll just sit in their car watching, you know, their kids out there suffering in the rain. Well, as I said, there's no point in us all uh, being miserable, wow. is there? <laughs> Uh, the big news of the weekend Diego Maradoherty is back says Briar that was a, he, he should be in the green do you see the hug it was one of those uncomfortable hugs where Antonio Conte wrapped the arms around him then sort of shook the head in a passive aggressive way but you're my boy you're my boy Matt I told you you could do this how, how long will he be his boy is there two more games left uh, one, the, more game one left. more game left one more game left it was, like, he was very good um, but Emerson Royal does seem to be his favourite son in that right-back position came straight back in the Champions League. Uh, but there's a lot of games. They're playing Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, constantly yeah. between now. Yeah, so. I, I, I like it. Change the team up. Fresh legs, fresh energy. Uh, Jack2022 says, TJ Reid in the green consistently delivers club and county Ballyhale five in a row. I know club not as popular but deserves mention. Paul Murphy for East Kerry was unreal. I did see Owen Sheehan had the, um, the laptop up in uh, Mexico watching the... In the end, it was a bit of a damn squib. Um... Uh, it was interesting, though, Eddie Brennan was tweeting that the debate is over. TJ Reid is the greatest of all time. I was like, well, that was interesting. The, uh, the next Kilkenny reunion will be interesting. Yeah. Stefan's like, huh? 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 Yeah. Uh, Henry was uh, in the dressing room before on Friday as well, um, talking to the Ballyhale players. Obviously a very emotional occasion for Ballyhale as well, at five in a row. So, TJ, I, uh, we'll, uh, like, we'll have to do the ultimate rundown. We, we need uh, different criteria. To decide. Is it just between TJ and Henry? Like if it is, it's a bit insane. Well, the two greatest hurlers of all time come from the same tiny little village. Well, uh, d- you know, DJ was on the... D- DJ's... Uh, it's a good point. Neither, uh, neither TJ or Henry made the Kilkenny Mount Rushmore. Maybe that needs revisited. Maybe that we could go back to that one. Uh, Aina Carroll says, The A-team on this morning. Surely Shane Walsh in the green. Booed every time he got the ball. Man of the match. Medal in the pocket. Vindicated. I saw somebody referring to him as a uh, Terry Butcher style headdress, and I was like, I wonder does that does that reference land with a lot of people? I uh, I brought this up in commentary last week. Um, Jordan Ayew ended up with. I said I mentioned this to Brian Kerr. We need a more modern uh, comparison because the automatic reaction for everybody of our age is Terry Butcher style. Yeah. Like, but who is who is the modern version? So somebody who's twenty five who has never heard of Terry Butcher. Yeah. Did any did any of that ever have a bandage covered in blood in a match? That's who we're talking about. Yeah. Right, go on. Next. Uh, in the amber, the Connacht Football Championship. In fact, just the GEA Championships. I was out uh, after, uh, you know, standing on the sideline in a polite manner on Saturday morning. I got in my car on Saturday afternoon, uh, flicking through the stations, ad break on News Talk, so just flicking through to see what's happening. The next thing I hear, Mayo will play Ross... What, 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 Mayo will play Ross Common in what now? In what now? Is this the... The talking about the league? The fixtures out for the league. Oh no, it turns out the draws for the GA Championships were on on Saturday afternoon. That's next summer's GA Championship, well, next spring's GA Championship. And yes, uh, the Connacht football draw is, I would say, the most interesting one of all, where on the one side, you have Galway, Mayo, and Ross Common, and then on the other side, you got everybody else. Uh, the last time this happened, London got to the final. Back in 2013. All oh, right, and what, what would what would that happen? What would that? Why does this matter, Nathan? Well, it matters more than ever because it means that one of London, New York, Leitrim, or Sligo are going to play in the All Ireland series next year. So, as we know, the top 16. Well, that makes sense. That uh, one of the Division Four teams could end up being ranked higher than a Division Two team. Oh, oh, but that that was the whole problem with Proposal B. They shot it down on the basis that something like this might happen. And lo and behold, oh, it happened with your shitty system. Well, well that done, is lads. exactly... Well a, you killed something much better, and now you've got something completely rubbish. But that anyway. is exactly what will happen. Uh, the two teams that start this season in Division 2 but are relegated are not going to be in the top 16. Uh, now, they knew that anyways. But it does mean that there are potentially teams higher up the rankings in Division 2 who may not be guaranteed a place in the All-Ireland series next year. The reason for this, so Talton Cup winners automatically get in, which means Westmead are in, uh, Westmead are a Division 3 team, and one of those teams in Connacht, because all the provincial finalists get into the All-Ireland series. Now, the ideal scenario for this, and we spoke about this even with Westmead last year, is that a team 
in Division 3 has a really good league campaign. They win all their games, they win Division 3, they have a good provincial championship, they've got a load of momentum and they're going into the All-Ireland series and they get a real opportunity to test themselves against better opposition. Probably not going to qualify, but get an opportunity to test themselves against Dublin or Kerry or Tyrone and see what it's like against the Division 1 teams and progress. It's not set up for this scenario and we don't know what Leitrim and Sligo will do. Both of them have a lot of ambition. Uh, but but they every... would both really benefit from the Talton Cup and the groups in the Talton Cup next year. Now what's going to happen is that whoever comes through on that draw are going to be massive double-digit point underdogs against Division 1 teams. And and it's going to it's going to make the draw somewhat lopsided because they're going to be second seeds in the draw for the round-robin series uh, because they're the beaten provincial finalists. But you could have a scenario where it's one of these Connacht teams doesn't have a particularly good league campaign, You know, stays in Division 4, uh, they win their semi-final, they take an almighty beating in the Connacht final, and then they have to go out again with no momentum at all into an All-Ireland series. So it, it doesn't make any sense. Like there's, there is a slight possibility that you know, Mayo, Galway, Roscommon uh, end up being relegated from Division 1 and more teams from Division 3 or Division 4 get to provincial finals and they don't find their way into an All-Ireland series, it's highly, highly unlikely because, again, there's still 14 places up for grabs there. I think they'll all be fine. Uh, but does it change the way they look at the championship now that they're not going to be top seeds? Remember, what, these seeds are probably going to be fourth seeds now, so you're definitely going to have a group of death, it feels, uh, automatically, which is maybe no bad thing. And I think most people, and Sean Cavanaugh, was, uh, he was great on the draw, actually, because he just constantly kept saying, this is basically all a lot of nonsense. Like, why, why, is this being, <laughs> why is this being allowed to happen? The Munster draw happened. He's like, who cares? Like, really? Uh, it was uh, Limerick and Kerry were seeded, but Cork and Kerry are on opposite sides of the draw. So if it goes... Sandy. Um, <clears throat> and Cork uh, have to play Clare, so it's the, it's the teams at the bottom of Division 2 who are going to struggle to qualify for... Well, it also means that a, the team that wins Division 3, if it's not Westmead, uh, won't get through now to an All-Ireland series. So, you know, you don't get to build that momentum. So, listen, it's too early to be... Uh, having this draw anyways right. like if, you're, yeah. if, you're in Kil- if you're Kildare well it, it's too early they've had it now so that no one is paying any attention to it so nobody realises what's happened well you should, you should pay attention because Kildare might be one of those counties under a bit of pressure here you know they're on the same side of the draw as Dublin in the Leinster Championship they're in Division 2 as well so they're one of those teams who could potentially lose out so now actually their league is the single most important thing for them next season as opposed to the Championship being so it has all this massive unintended consequences where you know we're going to have um, the, the dubs on the road to Carrick and Shannon it'll be a great occasion and it'll be you know not actually a real opportunity for Leitrim to measure their progress against teams of a similar standard whereas actually last year we saw teams of a similar standard they had great games but what, what anyway if you look that's because the provincial championships, just in case anybody is, is uncertain, the provincial councils clung to their power like limpets. And as a result, we now have the, these provincial championships being of more importance and more significance than next season's championship. Uh, the next season's... Ah, look at you, you know what I'm talking about. But, but here, the provincial champ, like in Connacht, they might be delighted. They've got Mayo against Ross Common, first day out, Kevin McStay Derby, imagine the hype and the buzz. The winners of that play go away in a semi final, another massive crowd, and then you've got a kind of final where you're always going to get a big crowd. So, are you? Maybe you will. I'm sure they, they, they don't care what happens after that, do they? On we roll. 7.53 this morning. Right, uh, we need greens. Uh, first up in the green, Shelburne into the FAI Cup final for the first time in 11 years. Haven't won the Cup since the year 2000, since the turn of the century. But Duffer has brought them back to the big time. Uh, Obviously, the performance and the result is important, but I think it was Duffer's post-match interview yesterday. uh, It's not all about him. Have we got Duffer's post-match interview? Let's listen to what Duffer had to say after the game. Uh, Listen, I'll have to change my mindset because all I've said all along was get to the final, get to the final. I never addressed whether winning the final. So the guys, the staff, myself alone, We'll have to, to change that mindset. Yeah, we're in it to win it now. Um, but listen, we've won. We shouldn't be here. Little old shells, as people call us. Everyone hates us, I think. Uh, we're in the division for another year. And we're, uh, we're in a final. Hey, it doesn't get any better. Well done. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> there you go. Ah, uh, little old shells. Everyone hates us. Uh, I think. I think. Uh, I think you're wrong, Damien. Does anybody hate shells? Aside from, you know, maybe Bulls fans or Pats fans. Does anybody really 
Hey, shells? No, they don't. I think actually shells uh, for your neutral fan now with Duffer there. Oh, people yeah. want people yeah. want them to do well, but he's obviously trying to build some sort of a siege mentality. It is straight out of the Jose Mourinho playbook. Like he he learned a lot from Jose Mourinho. He is controlling the post match talking points constantly. Uh, he knows exactly that everything he says will be picked up, and he's trying to get into his players. Nobody likes us. We're not going out in the we're not going out in the FAI Cup final, and you know. 31 counties, 31 places. Well, De- wants us Derry to will this. be strong favourites for the final. Derry will be strong favourites. Like, it's a huge, huge achievement for Shells to get back in. Like, he, he was playing down expectations at the start of the season. Like, you know, they were just promoted, uh, but they've survived comfortably. A couple of better results over the last few weeks, and maybe they could have started looking up a little bit more in, in the league table and push for a position in the top five. They've had some big, big results as well. They've had, like, so in one-off games, they've proven that they're actually capable of beating the best teams. Well, exactly, and they should have beaten They should have beaten Shamrock Rovers, you know, last week out in Tala, uh, you know, beaten by a last-minute goal. But now they're in a cup final. Uh, you know, Damien Duff said that was the aim, to get to a cup final. Now they need to go and win it. I think it's a good cup final, you know, in terms of getting a big crowd. Uh, Derry have a massive support. I think anybody with any interest in shells will go there. I'd imagine a lot of neutrals will want to see uh, what it's like. You know, it was always probably going to be this way once the draw was made, where you had shells and Derry on opposite sides, and you know Derry just got over the line against Treaty Shells, made hard enough work of it uh, against uh, Waterford yesterday. But yeah, like Duffer. He, he's all in on this as and he keeps saying office, yeah. he and is the, all in on this it's, it's like it's clearly something exactly and he's he's obviously uh, I think was somebody saying he's not sleeping very well at the moment like I really hope he sticks around for into the medium term like three five years of Duffer in the league would really help transform what people think of it and as a career path and like you know he doesn't he's not doing it for the money he's doing it because he loves football and giving back in a way that it'd be great to see loads of his contemporaries give back to the league and say yeah this is a great place for me to uh, earn my stripes and to you know uh, pay it forward so and he's been he's been very successful at it right Arsenal in the green also in the green Liverpool yeah Liverpool and Arsenal um, we don't usually have two teams in there but uh, yeah well, Arsenal are top of the Premier League uh, Manchester City were beaten yesterday so uh, so neither are looking a bit comfortable at the top it's, I said it before such a shame Arsenal Manchester City should have been on on Wednesday night. Uh, but because of the Queen, we don't get that game and it's been pushed right back because it would have been a real opportunity for Arsenal to put some daylight between themselves and Manchester City. Uh, Liverpool are back, their best performance of the season by an absolute mile. It felt from pretty much the first minute as though this was the Liverpool of, of old, of you know, six months ago, <laughs> yeah. three months ago. And, like, and there was Not giving away a goal in the first minute, turns out that's good for you. Well, exactly. There was a real intensity to everything that they did. Uh, it was the front four pressing right up in Manchester City, not giving them any time in the ball, uh, you know, blocking the supply lines to Haaland. And Gomez and Van Dijk were exceptional. Gomez got mad at the match, but Van Dijk, I thought, was the best player on the pitch by a mile. The fact that his range of passing, which we haven't seen as often as you don't get the two fullbacks involved as much as they did, but because they had to sit so deep to make sure that there was no space for Haaland, they were so reliant on Van Dijk being able to pick out those 70, 80 yard crossfield balls to James Milner, at right back, uh, who didn't really put a foot wrong either. And it, it did feel like watching Liverpool at their very, very best again, which you know, raises questions as to, is it a mentality thing? Like, can, they get, can they get back up again against West Ham? On Wednesday night, they they have to because that was it, that was the genius of Liverpool over the last five years is that they somehow managed to turn up with that intensity all the time, but week lo- in week out. Losing the Champions League final, there it's a, like strong possibility it gives you a hangover. Like it's a very natural human thing. I was like, oh my god, look how far we went. We went to, we went to the last game of the season in all the competitions, and we ended up really with nothing important to show for it. I can I can see how in the middle of the team there's just this kind of broken heart that needs some time to heal possibly now you know football moves fast you don't really get time to heal yeah, and but maybe we didn't think of maybe that. that's it maybe that's a season gone maybe it's not maybe this kick starts them and we know they're that still Liverpool, in the Champions League we know well they still have Champions League and we know that Liverpool can go on a run like they've done it consistently and like it was actually just brilliant to watch that game yesterday because these matches have elevated the Premier League to a whole new level over the past four or five years and it felt as though this might be the one where it starts to fall apart, but it was every bit as good and intense as any of them that we've seen over the last few years. Almost all the big names stepped up, like Salah's goal 
when you watch the angle from behind, that how he manages to take that down while spinning away having had from a miss. Joao Cancelo, having had that miss earlier on, like yeah. that was an insane, insane sort of 10 minute spell. Give me 10 seconds on Arsenal here before uh, the Arsenal, because the Arsenal fans have already got the comments written, so. Uh, they uh, were fortunate, it turned out, VAR, I don't know if you saw this, where the game was delayed for 40 minutes and everyone's like, just get on with the game, it doesn't matter about VAR, just, uh, which I would agree with, like if the VAR doesn't work and there's a power failure and the referee, like, you know, just get on with the game and, and do it. Uh, thank Christ for Arsenal, they managed to get the VAR working, uh, so, Patrick Bamford misses a penalty. Apparently, the uh, leads were very good in the second half. And then right in the end, uh, deep into injury time, uh, Gabriel gets sent off, gives away a penalty. VAR, it was a far skill decision. Patrick, I don't know if you saw this, uh, Gabriel is sort of standing there and Patrick Bamford comes up and like rams himself into him. Uh, sends Gabriel flying. As he's on the ground falling backwards, his sort of foot goes up towards Patrick Bamford, who throws himself to the ground in agony. Uh, straight right card for Gabriel. Uh, penalty for Leeds and then VAR intervened and thought actually Gabriel doesn't touch him here and yeah. Patrick Bamford is the one who was at fault so listen there's a, not, there's a big VAR big opportunity the is what I hear VAR is in the but green but there's a big 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 opportunity here for Arsenal is that I think you know they are a really quality side and there are flaws in this Manchester City team ok uh, that's this week's Gillette Labs performance rankings OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette Right, Mike Carlson is with us to talk NFL. Mike, good morning to you. How are you? Uh, good morning, Jer. I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, good. So the, the people will remember last season that the Buffalo Bills and the Kansas City Chiefs played out one of the highest scoring. And if you like scoring and high quality offensive play, one of the greatest games of all time. The um, revenge match was last night and uh, the Buffalo Bills got a measure of revenge for what happened last year. Are they now the greatest show on turf at the moment? I don't, I don't think you can really put it that way. I'm not sure there is a greatest show on turf. You know, you go back to Thursday night, include that. Here's the halftime scores. 3-3-10-3-10-7-10-9-10-6-14-13-9-3-10-7-10-10-21-14-20-14. There isn't a lot of great show on turf going on this season, to be honest. Um, and if you remember last year, too, in the in the – in the um, match last year that this that was basically the the same as this one in week five, Buffalo won that in Kansas City too. So they they kind of proved that. I think what we're seeing is that Buffalo is probably the best balanced team in the league, which is something you said last year as well. Um, and they managed to contrive to lose that playoff game that you were talking about to the Chiefs. And the Chiefs, even without Tyree Kill, are still very explosive but they're not the most explosive team. Um, they're finding ways now to to replace Hill. Uh, Marquez Valdez Scantling had a long catch, which was important, and Juju Smith-Schuster, or J2S2, um, you know, made some plays for them as well. But basically, Buffalo is so well-balanced and so hard to beat if you're depending on explosive plays. And this is kind of the story of the league this year. Everybody's been talking about too deep coverage. In other words, two safeties who play relatively deep, keep everything in front of them. And what they don't talk about is that there are very few quarterbacks who can consistently beat that kind of coverage because the way to beat it is you have to work up the field Gradually, they're going to give you the underneath. They're just not going to let you have the over the top big chunk play. So you have to be able to consistently move the ball forward. And there aren't that many good quarterbacks in the league right now who can do that. You okay. know, there's, there's, there's probably four great quarterbacks in the league right now because the two greats who are still playing. Brady and Rodgers are looking very ordinary these days. Well, let, let's talk about Tom Brady, right? So it was an, in, an interesting week. Um took the day off midweek to go to a wedding. It was Robert Kraft's wedding, so you know you can might say he hey, kind of probably has, <laughs> probably probably has to show up, right? There's like yeah, a, if it was if it was Dan Snyder's wedding, <laughs> no way. Yeah, uh, but then there's the footage has gone viral of him absolutely screaming at the offensive line. Now I I think you know, I'm, I'm actually watching Man in the Arena uh, for my sins. It's um, I'm not sure I'm allowed to use the words to describe it, but it's um, you know, it's a uh, self self self-made self-publicizing thing and he's got great guests and great footage and it's it definitely if you're into your self-help in the Tom Brady cult it's really worth watching great stories but 
Um, he, he screams at everybody all the time. That's his that's his shtick. It's just that it's gone viral this week. I did feel if there was just a little bit of Tom is like got a lot going on in his life at the moment. Didn't show up for training midweek, and then the the lads in front of him who were supposed to protect him. They're not doing great, and they must be looking at him going, uh, "Look, mate, you know, <laughs> where were you?" Wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if there was an element of that. Of course, you know, you cut Brady a lot of slack because he's won seven Super Bowls, and um, you know, and he is at that grumpy old man age as well. But, and, you know, what you have to ask yourself is, is Tom not making the mistakes and it's all our fault or are we all making mistakes and, and we've got to put this all, put this all together, I think, if you're a lineman. And, um, you know, in, in fairness, he's got to have time right now. Um, and they, they just don't seem to be able to, um, to generate enough offense consistently to to put teams away early and their defense while it's while it's very good um isn't right now the kind of defense that's putting pressure on teams and, and forcing them to make mistakes the idea that they could you know i'm not surprised they only got 18 against pittsburgh there's a couple of mistakes they would have got more I'm, i was actually surprised that they gave up 20 to pittsburgh um and i think you know in, in my mind that's where that's where the game was lost uh, you know, I'd I'd be very curious to see what happened if he did show up and practice on Wednesday with teams because uh, we were we were talking about this when um, Thompson got the start for Miami, even though um, Teddy Bridgewater was cleared in concussion protocol, and actually later on Tua was cleared as well. But but the idea with Teddy at least was that the guy who's practiced in the week is the guy who's prepared for the game. And, you know, and obviously everyone would say, well, that doesn't apply to Brady because he doesn't need so much time. But I think maybe physically you just need to be out there, you know, and, and getting in the rhythm and getting the timing right with everybody. Yeah. And plus he's 45. Like, I don't know what our expectations are. You know, it's it's been a freak that he managed to still be really good last season, the year after he won the Super Bowl. The fact that he might still be really good as well at 45 would be... <laughs> You know, on her, on, like it, it, it doesn't make any sense. And what would make sense is that this is the end. Um, what might also make sense is this: this might be the end of Aaron Rodgers too. His form. Yeah. What's his What's his excuse? He's only like forty one. <laughs> the ayahuasca didn't work. <laughs> the um. Yeah. I mean, that's the third game in a row where Rodgers has has not looked great. Um, in L- London, being the second one, they won the game against the Patriots, which they were really lucky to win against a team that was playing a rookie third string quarterback um against them but he's matt lafleur i think has been out coached three weeks in a row and and this the same thing happened to an extent that happened in london when when they went down and you need to come out and you need to sort of re-establish yourself and and um or uh, not necessarily down but they but the other team got back in the game you need to eat some clock give your defense a rest you know uh, they come out and, and Rogers kind of throws these desultory long passes. Um, and in this, in this game, he missed twice. He missed, he underthrew and then he overthrew Romeo dubs. Um, and both times dubs was in a position to be able to make a play if the ball was on, was on the money. And, you know, I say desultory deliberately because it, it really looks like he's kind of going through motions yeah. um, as it were. And we know that, you know, as much turmoil as Tom Brady's had, um, Rogers has had almost as much one, one way or another. Un- relieved, you know, Brady can't go home to Giselle. Rogers can go to Pack McAfee on Mondays and you know and blow off his excess tension. But I'm not sure that that's the best thing. Well, uh, he needs somebody to tell him to cop himself on. One, one, um, we'll obviously talk about the New York teams as the season goes on because they're incredible stories. Um, you know, even early on in the season. The knives were getting sharpened for Robert Sala, and all of a sudden, you know, they're they're meaningful contenders. Um, but meanwhile, like slowly but surely, kind of like the Terminator and Terminator Two, Bill Belichick is even though he keeps getting like bullet in the head, uh, he keeps building this team who, you know, absolutely blew the Browns out of it in a game that really should have suited the Browns. The third string rookie quarterback is like, no big deal. Yeah, we'll stick up 29. No, actually 30 something points. And the the injured wide receiver that hasn't played a game comes out of nowhere, touches the ball four times, scores two touchdowns. You're like, all right. So uh, maybe Bill Belichick will have the last laugh after all. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I still kind of wish that their offense was, was a bit more imaginative, but they, they did come up um, and and make a few plays this time instead of being incredibly predictable. But 
it, it's typical. They're not the only team that is run oriented and defense oriented in the league right now, as opposed to kind of big play oriented. And they're, it's kind of old school football, but it also works against teams who are stuck in, in kind of too high zone defense, zone defenses. Now he's out. Again, I, they out, he out coached Matt LaFleur three, and lost. He's out coached two coaches in a row now where, you know, um, De- and Detroit and Cleveland, but these are not great teams that the Patriots are beating and they keep making mistakes, which good teams would pounce on. Um, and they don't have to be great teams, just good teams. You think of the first week of the season where they lost to Miami and they made a couple of mistakes and otherwise they they probably could have won that game. But it, it really is, you know, incredible to see how when you're doing the basics right, um, you, you can come up with these wins. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, that I was naming all the games because there were so many games that were like reunion games. Belichick, of course, coached in Cleveland at the start of his career. The other quarterback, Jacoby Brissett, was a Patriots quarterback. So, you know, I, I was wondering if some some one of the stats gurus had a stat for, you know, what was Bill Belichick's record coming back to teams he used to coach against quarterbacks he drafted. Yeah, I, I bet you it's like there's a zero at the end of it. Uh, Mike, yeah. we're, we're out of time. Great to have you with us again. Thanks a million. Uh, Cheers. Okay, thanks, Chair. It's Mike Carson now giving us a look back at the weekend. One thing, Nathan, I was thinking, um, he's 45, Brady, right? And his, his next contract is $350 million with Fox. So if you're going into like the 22-year-old fresh out of college who's never earned anything and you're asking him to protect you and you're not showing up for work in the middle of the week and your next contract is more money for not even playing the game, just for talking about it, than he's ever going to see in his life. How does that relationship work, you know? I bet you Tom is still sending the thumbs up into the emoji group, unaware of the fact, blissfully unaware of the fact that the people he's sending it to think he's being a dick for sending it. Well, uh, and maybe this will uh, be the perfect segue. Like, is there a comparison with uh, Cristiano Ronaldo at Manchester United? That from afar you can look at this and say, well, would any 22-year-old not just give anything to be in a dressing room with Tom Brady? And you probably think that, but then you're there and results aren't going well and he's off doing whatever the hell he wants. Yeah. And you're going, well, actually, you know. He spends his time shouting at you. The, the novelty of getting to uh, sit beside him and have a chat with him. And likewise with Ronaldo last year. Like, they, he comes in, this guy, it can only be a great thing for the young yeah, players. Yeah. What a professional. Turns out, like, wreaks havoc on the dressing room, uh, undermines the captain, and again, hammers you at every possible occasion. Is, is, are you going to like that guy? I'm not sure. We're going to move to uh, soccer with um, Samuel Luckers of the Manchester Evening News. A reminder, OTBAM is brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at Movember.com. Before all that, though, David Brady managed Ratoth to the Mead senior football title yesterday against Conor Gillespie's Summer Hill. Speaking with our own Ashing Riley afterwards about the schmozzle between both managers. You might have seen this at the end of the game that saw Brady hit the deck back after this. And you obviously have history playing Mead back in the day. 1996 comes to mind. <laughs> Did you ever imagine in 1996 in that brawl that you'd be here standing here managing a, a Rateau team to a Mead senior title? And, and hitting the deck as well. <laughs> I, don't think I, I don't think I hit the deck in 96, but I hit it today. And look, it was, it was, it was innocuous and it was, there was nothing to it. And it was emotions with a minute left oh, yeah. in a county final. Sure, look it. And again, I'll probably learn how. I'm wearing runners on the sideline rather than boots. So, yeah, I need to. I need to look after the. Uh, I need to get new footwear. So I do. Yeah. For people that don't know and haven't seen the game, this will go out and off the ball. So what did happen? There was a bit of a schmozzle on the schmozzle, side. Yeah, with the two managers at the end and was, other players. I don't know. Pull, yeah. We were trying to pull fellas off, and uh, fellas were trying to pull fellas on, and. Man says I, uh, I, I up scuttled and uh, man says landed on the uh, landed on the ground, and uh, Asher's ground. And you yeah. Know red, red card. Yeah. Well, someone saw it, but uh, man says honest to God, um, I put my hand up for ninety six, but not for uh, twenty twenty two. No. <laughs> and manager um, Gillespie, he came in afterwards. Connor, he spoke. Yeah, Connor, Connor spoke. spoke and room, yeah. uh, look, at, you're going to yourself. Well, yeah, not even that. There was nothing to it. And Jesus, it's a. Uh, it's a county final and emotions run high, but that's the most important thing. And they're great guys. Great, Connor, I respect Connor highly and he's a ma- fantastic team. And I hope to God that, as I said, look after yourself for the next few days. Yeah. It is hard it because is. you put in so much effort. Um, but yeah, if it was the other end, the knives would be out. But, you know, you go and have a few beers and you, 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 you surround yourself by good people. And that's the important thing. And David. OTB AM. This 
is OTB Sports Radio. Off the Ball Daily. A home for your favourite podcasts from Off the Ball. The performance rankings, a slight tangent, the crappy quiz, and you had to be there. Five goals in 20 minutes. It's just, you can't do that. It's the Premier League. You can't do that. Subscribe to the Off the Ball Daily podcast feed right now. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Whatever you grow, we'll save a bro. It's uh, 15 minutes past eight and you're very welcome back to OTBAM brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Now, Samuel Luckhurst is with us this morning. Samuel, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. Very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on again. Uh, most of the rest of the football world was watching um, Liverpool and Manchester City and so not a lot of people will have seen <coughs> the Manchester United performance against Newcastle. Uh, minor controversy when Ronaldo gets substituted off and is um, having a bit of a strop. But that aside, what was the quality of the performance like for Manchester United? It, it was a backward step yesterday. They, they started reasonably brightly, but once Newcastle got settled in, um, it, it was difficult for United to, to break them down. Without Christian Eriksen, they do struggle for a solution against teams who sit in a low block, who have a very... Um, obvious game plan, a tried and tested game plan at Old Trafford, but one that is likelier to succeed these days because United is still trying to transition to this style that Ten Hag wants to implement. But after looking pretty good in the first half against Everton uh, eight days ago, yesterday was 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 a massive backward step in that Newcastle were the better side in the first half and they didn't do anything extraordinary, but they were just more competitive, they're more intense too many individuals in, in a red shirt just didn't turn up. Uh, it was slightly better in the second half. Newcastle did tire, uh, which is predictable, but United still didn't fashion enough clear openings. It was only in the last five or seven minutes, really, where you had that opportunity for Fred from uh, the square ball from from Rashford, and then, of course, Rashford's header that, that went wide in the 95th minute. But it would have been flattering on United had they had, had they got a win yesterday because Newcastle were well, dis- well worthy of a point really does underline the importance of Christian Eriksen to the side because, listen, Casemiro is obviously a world-class talent at what he does, but his job is getting the ball to more talented players. Likewise with Fred, it's keep it simple. You don't want him trying too much. Give it to the more talented players. Or have an Eriksen in that deeper role who can play that 40-yard, 50-yard pass, who can cut one through the middle quickly to Fernandez or Rashford. It changes the dynamic of that United team completely. Like, there's very... Trying to think of the top teams who have two holding midfielders. There's very few of them who need to play two holding midfielders. He's the only lock picker in that squad, Ericsson. And for all the record investment in the summer, it's it's the freebie who has, has really underlined his importance. And, and yesterday was the first time that he didn't start in the Premier League. He, he wasn't even in the squad at all because he was unwell. So that restricted... Ten Hag's game-changing options. Rashford was the only player who came on. He only didn't start because he was he was feeling under the weather as well, in Ten Hag's words. The, the two midfielders United had to possibly change the game were never, ever going to come on uh, in, in, in Zidane Iqbal and, and Kobe Mainu. Both those players were in a Premier League squad for the first time yesterday. Mainu is only 17. He looks a very good talent. He's, po- he's possibly the most uh, polished player of that Youth Cup winning side from last season. But he was starting for the under-21s against Chelsea at King's Meadow on Saturday. Iqbal is a tidy player, but he's he's not been particularly tested beyond some pre-season games. So one or two injuries or one, one or two absences from midfield, and they're very light there. And already it's becoming clear... Um, I mean, the clocks haven't even gone back yet, but as far as that next block of their rebuild, the squad rebuild goes at United, you have to say that they, they're going to need another midfielder there, which of course will um, restart the Frankie de Jong talk again, particularly given um, the, the dire week Barcelona have just had, and it looks like they're not going to qualify for the Champions League knockout stage as well. And, and de Jong is still not getting um, enough playing time under Chavi, but they do need someone of De Jong's profile because Ericsson is 30. Everybody knows what happened in Copenhagen last year. I think that's been an issue that United have uh, addressed over the last week in terms of benching him against Ammonia, but they still needed to bring him on in that game because, again, beyond him being the only lot picker in the team or in the squad, they do not have enough reliable goal scorers either. 
yeah, it's um, <clears throat> you know, it was it was a good window uh, in the end in terms of getting players in who will be first team players and who can make a significant difference to the team. But it it really was uh, a, a rehabilitative piece of work that was the beginning of a process as opposed to the end of a process. It, the game yesterday is a good opportunity to kind of gauge where they are versus the other teams who are probably in the hunt or just behind the teams who are feeling very strongly about finishing the top four. Like, do Manchester United need to be winning these games at this stage against the Newcastles of the world to try and quell the fact that Newcastle are going to get a lot of confidence and they could go on a run and easily pip them to top four? I still think that it, that's too premature for Newcastle. Yesterday, really, they, they were too reticent in the second half. I think if they're playing like that next season, then there'll be question marks asked of of their ambition and, and, and of Eddie Howe, really. At this stage, I think, obviously, they're going to take a point. But the way they approached it, they, they were probably less adventurous than they were at Anfield, um, how, however long ago that was, earlier in the season when, when Liverpool won with, with the, almost the last kick of the game and Newcastle bungled a couple of opportunities on the breakaway just before them. They, they weren't as adventurous yesterday in the second half. They were in the first half. They had some gumption about themselves. But also, in terms of the point of United really needed to win that game, Newcastle had some key players absent as well. Uh, Isaac, who's looked a, a very good signing and, and has potential to, to lead the line for them for a long time. He wasn't playing. Willock's been an important player for them in midfield. He wasn't starting either. So when you still look at that Newcastle team, it's a team that United should should be aiming to beat. And th- this this period of games was always going to be a good gauge of United in that they've, of course, got Tottenham on, at home on Wednesday and then Chelsea on Saturday. So within a, a six or seven day period, they've got three huge games. They've played one, um, not scored in it. And last week with those two home games, the only goal they did get was a 93rd minute uh, from Scott McTominay against Ammonia uh, in, in the Europa League. So th- I think these concerns... They've, they've not just all of a sudden come to light in pre-season. You looked at the investment in that squad, but you still looked at it and thought that they're hanging their hats on certain players to get goals or come good when you can't be certain of their reliability. Anthony is a case in point in that they've spent an obscene amount of money on a player who, watching him yesterday as well, um, he's not particularly quick. He was up against Dan Byrne, who's a good, you know, solid Premier League defender, he's a centre-back and he's playing at left-back and he wasn't getting outpaced by Anthony and he's also painfully one-footed um, to the point that it's all, already apparent that defenders know how to how to play him. It's just get him onto his right foot and then he's extremely limited. And Ten Hag has said about how he needs to show variations and maybe that will come in, in time and he will develop. But if this is a player that United have spent, as I said, £85 million on you're going to need some instant impacts and fair enough to him. He's, he's got the goals, but even on his debut, although you can't be too critical at that point, there were aspects of his game where you saw it and you thought that's going to take time to uh, you know, to knock into shape because as, as, as much as he has been scoring and he's got a decent record, of course, in the Premier League of, of three goals in four games, it has been masking his performance level, which has just not been high enough. It's It's been too erratic. Uh, Ronaldo wasn't particularly pleased to come off and probably less pleased when he saw Marcus Rashford miss a couple of opportunities that he would have certainly backed himself to take. Uh, it's always a big story when Ronaldo's taken off, particularly when it's the only substitution and he's maybe thrown the arms around a bit. Uh, his overall performance levels, considering he got that start, like does he deserve to be in the team for games of this stature against teams of the quality of Newcastle? This is the other issue United have in the they look a lot much better side and a more complete side up front when Anthony Marshall is starting and he started one Premier League game in the last year for them. Their attack revolved around Marshall in pre-season. He played well. Pre-season can be meaningless, but they had continuity with him, Sancho and Rashford playing. Marshall got injured a week before the season started and it really has compromised the fluidity of that attack and how Ten Hag has... Um, has managed it as well. You, it's easy to forget the first weekend of the season, Christian Eriksen was effectively playing up front in a in a strikeless formation and Ronaldo was on the bench. Ronaldo was really poor yesterday. He was more of a hindrance than a help. 
he was dropping too deep. Um, I, I wonder if he's consciously doing that to try and show that he can be a flexible forward and that this talk of him being too rigid and being a bit of an obstacle to how United want to play, that's him railing against it. The, the, the other way of looking at it is that he, he's dropping so deep because every time he was further forward, he was always offside. Uh, and this is another issue in that old father time is catching up with him. And he is always looking to be ahead of the last defender. There were times yesterday where Newcastle could have easily had um, or, or easily played offside against Ronaldo, against United's counter-attacks. They didn't consciously do it and he would still end up offside. I think it was towards the end of the first half, Anthony put a cross in that was over here. But Ronaldo, he, he wasn't getting to it. He yeah. wasn't flagged offside, but he was offside. And so you know, Marshall was was missing again yesterday. He has become injury prone. Again, United are, are hanging their hats there on someone who, as I said, has only started one Premier League game uh, in the last year for them. That lasted 29 minutes at Everton just over a week ago. And... Is he a reliable goal scorer? You cannot say that for certain no. whatsoever. And, and Marshall turns 27 in December. Uh, <clears throat> Anthony Ryan, one of our, our listeners, wants to know, can you ask Samuel why Facundra Palestri isn't uh, getting off Manchester United? He's a Uruguay international. This is the 20-year-old. Uh, he's on the bench yesterday, but never a hint of him really getting any game time, is there? No. Uh, one of the strangest signings uh, they've made in recent years, and they've, they've got form for doing that. I think it's something like, it's, it's like two years and 11 days. I think I clocked it yesterday since he signed and he has still not had a competitive kick. He's been on the bench a, a bunch of times, but I, I always think it's a red flag when you sign a player and then you loan him out to an overseas league. And Plestri is, is a Spanish speaker, so they put him to, to, to Alaves in, in La Liga for a couple of different loan spells. But when you're doing that, it's almost as if you're assimilating to a different league and La Liga is a markedly different league from the Premier League and there was there was merit in actually putting him on yesterday because Anthony was too uh, one dimensional they probably needed a more direct winger uh, it, it was worth going with a wild card option but he was someone who was signed on Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's watch on a very haphazard deadline day that's not aged well whatsoever in that United signed Cavani uh, very opportunistically he picked and choose when he played they signed Alex Tellez who peaked on his debut and was was pretty worthless for the majority of his time thereafter. And then they invested £46 million in Palestri and Ahmad Diallo, who's now on loan at Sunderland. So I, I, I it's, it's difficult to see him having a, a pathway under Ten Hag. And during pre-season, the, the, I think the ex expectation was that he was going to go out on loan. He got injured. That scuffed a loan move. So United are saddled with him, or Ten Hag is saddled with him until January and doesn't seem particularly inclined to, to give him a chance. What a transfer window when you put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, were there boos at the end? It, kind of difficult to... to um, there were there some boos. And, and is that just because the performance midweek was terrible? Uh, as you said, the last-minute goal um, from McTominay uh, against really a Nicosia team who weren't that good and then it's nil all so are the fans genuinely beginning to turn on the team a little bit or was it just a smattering what was your take on that it, it was it was quite as you say it was a smattering I think the the loudest the boos were, um, were reserved for the referee and the referee was bad but he was not decisively bad looking at those penalty shouts yesterday if anything Callum Wilson had the strongest of the lot uh, when when Varane was quite clumsy in his challenge with, with him in the first half Sancho took far too theatrical a tumble um, even though there was some contact from Longstaff that you felt instinctively at the time that VAR wouldn't intervene just because of, of the way he, he threw himself to the ground, but as I said, you know, the, the, there was there was just element of frustration from United fans, and that they'd seen a, a pretty worthless game. It was a really poor game. There was not a light, not a lot to write home about whatsoever, and and the referee didn't really help matters. There were a lot of stoppages. There was a lot of time wasting, and um, there wasn't a great deal of flow to the game. Whereas obviously at City yesterday, I think the the referee, despite the, the flash point with the disallowed goal. Um, he seemed to get a fair few kudos for actually letting the game flow whilst and, and letting you know, over, overlooking challenges. So th there's no real sign of, of United fans turning at the moment, and it's difficult to see that happening. Certainly before the World Cup starts as well. But these next two games are pretty pretty big to say the least, and that they can't lose too much ground 
on the teams in the top four. And I think at the start of kickoff yesterday, Tottenham were eight points ahead of them. It's obviously been trimmed a little bit, but if Tottenham win on Wednesday, that that could have a you know a profound impact on their season. The big game, obviously, the weekend was at Anfield yesterday. Liverpool's best performance of the season, Manchester City's first defeat of the season. Arsenal are now four points clear. I was just saying, such a shame that that game is not on Wednesday night, and an opportunity for Arsenal to maybe really put some daylight between themselves and City. Is is it just two very good teams yesterday in Liverpool edge Manchester City out, or was there something Liverpool identified? Do you think from that game that maybe gives the rest hope when we've all been assuming that Erling Haaland will score forty five goals this season and City will win the league by ten or fifteen points? Like maybe that just won't be the case. I mean, Liverpool have the hex over City at Anfield in the City have not won there with a capacity crowd since two thousand three. I mean, it was so long ago. Peter Schmeichel was in goal for them and. Uh, Gerard Houllier would have still been the, the Liverpool manager. City won there during lockdown um, in, in the behind closed doors era. And I, I don't think that's a coincidence. There's, there's just something about Anfield. And I think that was reflected in Guardiola's comments after the game when he was asked about the, the coins being tossed at him. And he said, oh, they, they miss me, but they, they got the bus a few years ago. I mean, City have got a, a big hang up about that night from the Champions League quarter finals in 2018, where they had an extremely hostile uh, welcome uh, to put it mildly and it's it's just one of those grounds that they they can't seem to uh, to to really properly turn it on at i mean the game there last season was 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 a blistering game that that 2-2 two, two, both of them were uh, but i think really looking at liverpool yesterday it's it's amazing how much more however big these teams are they seem to revel more um and and they get more out of their players when they are the, the underdogs. Uh, you saw that with United against Liverpool uh, at home in in August, when United had been battered four 0 by Brentford um, nine days earlier. And sometimes that's going to lift players. Uh, that the crowd seemed a lot more up for it. And it's, I think, the one takeaway from being present for behind closed doors games and then being present and having the privilege of you know, fans being allowed back in and seeing how players cope with it is that a crowd makes a hell of a lot of a difference. And a lot of players had good seasons in the behind closed door era because they prefer playing football without supporters present, which is not a reliable gauge of, of a footballer's quality. But I, I, there are still certain grounds when, when they turn it on that they, they can unnerve players. And as as, as, you, as I touched upon earlier, with, with a disallowed goal, I, I can see it from both sides. I think that the, the line tone that City went with afterwards about the referee letting things go, but then deciding that that was a foul, I think is a, is a valid point. But there is a tug from Haaland. And when you do slow it down, it does look always worse as well. And I think given the magnitude of the game and, and, and the rivalry that has brewed between those teams in the last five years, it would have been remiss of the officials not to have taken um, take, you know, taken the decision to overturn it at that point. I, I wonder if the letting it go is because of VAR as well, knowing that actually we can let the game flow and if there is mm. something missed, if some if a tackle is more severe than at first look, they can have a look at the video afterwards and change their mind because it was four or five fouls that actually if a goal had come at the end of it, they probably would have had to have gone back and overturned it because the referee was letting everything go. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, like Liverpool's home form, it is insane. Like there's never been a greater proof of the impact of a home crowd than the statistics around Liverpool. Like they haven't lost at home in front of a crowd in five and a half years. Palace beat them in April 2017. Yeah. Yeah. They lost six at home, six in a row at home during COVID when there was nobody there. Yeah. Six in a row. Yeah, well, that, that that's what I sensed at the time. I remember going to uh, cover United there and United got a nil-nil draw. And at the time you thought that was a decent point for United. And and then after that, that's when all, that those sequence of defeats started and Burnley won there and City finally won there. Everton finally won there. I think Fulham won there as well. There were a lot of teams that went to Anfield who hadn't won there in decades and then they won. And it's not a coincidence that they won those games because... The, the the cop was was empty. Um, the, the stands were sparse, and I, I don't think you can underestimate that. And it's you know it's, it's something that Liverpool have obviously. Um, sometimes the crowd can be overplayed at Anfield. I've I've been there on occasions where it has been quite humdrum, but there are also occasions where it is the most atmospheric uh, ground in in England when it's when it's in it you know in its absolute element and. 
I think City, as I said, there, there has been a rivalry brewing there in, in recent years and there have been certain incidents that um, have not gone down well at all with uh, the City side of things. But it's it's still a ground that Liverpool seem to have the hex over them, certainly when, when supporters are present. Samuel, great stuff. Great to have you with us. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thank you again. That's uh, Samuel Luckers there giving us his thoughts on the game. Um, did Pep get everything right yesterday? Uh, I thought De Bruyne's positioning was a bit strange like having him out on the right hand side and he had a couple of moments where he almost linked up when he did link up with Haaland and Haaland didn't take the chance but I sort of feel in the game like that you want De Bruyne deeper where he's more involved in the game where he's getting on the ball all the time whereas you're relying on somebody else to get it like he's stuck out on the right hand side a lot there was a big debate after the game between Carragher and Neville as to exactly the sort of system they were playing all the stats that even Sky had shown seem to suggest that Carragher was right that like Kinsella was in a line right beside De Bruyne for an awful lot of the game playing as a right wing back and Foden was on the other side like, did he get a lot wrong like, these games are one goal like City had chances well, so there's very little between them there, there's very little between them after the game you're saying there's very little between them before the game like we oh, we did we did our preview on the uh, football kickoff on Friday and like the general consensus was that City are two goal better team than Liverpool at the moment. I, I understand the point you're about to make about it's at Anfield and the record there is incredible and I listen to everything Samuel says and there's obviously there's something in their head about it but if it'd be nice to see Pep pick his best team with his best players in the best position in the big game once and just see what happens. Just well, see what happens. It, it, They're all good players. You really like them. Pick your best players it, in the best position once. It's different from a fortnight ago because they were at home in the Manchester derby but that performance was so good. Do you not just play Grealish on the left and play Foden on the right again? And play De Bruyne slightly deeper. Now Rodri was back; he wasn't available for that game. Like, maybe, maybe, He's maybe that was a good thing. Like maybe uh, not having in. that guy who just uh, keeps things nice and tidy uh, slows things down for Manchester City. Was that not, was yesterday not the day to suck Liverpool into the deep water and drown them and say thanks very much? Off you go, you're finished. But yes, it was more about Liverpool than City. Like Liverpool came out. In a way that Manchester United didn't afford. Okay, they were cornered on the moment. They're a much better. All team. guns blazing. Okay. They had all the intensity. Like they defended rocks all the way. All the more reason to punch them in the nose and go. But, that maybe, was your best. but they didn't let them punch them in the nose. Uh, well, but uh, is there not a little bit of Man City who are like, okay, we have to change things because the opposition is so good. Yeah, we can do that. It's fine. It's no big deal. It's a bit of a big deal, you know. It's just, uh, how many of those games where he's, he's made those significant changes? He's going to say, I do it all, I do it every week. You can't tell. You're, you're thick. I'm like, fair enough. You do know a lot more about football than the rest of the world, Pep. You know, I, 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 I was definitely surprised with the way that, um, that Cancelo played and the way that De Bruyne in particular. I just think De Bruyne, like he, he was as good as I've ever seen him in that Manchester derby. Like the drive, the way he was able to win the ball back deep in midfield and turn and sprint forward 30, 40 yards and create the chance for Haaland. He couldn't do that at all because he was stuck out on the right-hand side. That wasn't his game. That wasn't what they were asking him to do. You're right. It's very hard to disagree with Pep, but I, 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 I thought they could have gone about it very similar and even bring Rodri into the team, but play De Bruyne where he's at his best. Like You want Kevin De Bruyne touching the ball more than anybody else in the game. Yeah, yeah. But um, did Pep overthink it again? Uh, 8.38 this morning. Time for the sports pages. There are so many idiots out there, so many spoofers. There's a lot of horse. I think he's a total spoofer. What do you mean a spoofer? He's a bullshit. Ah, no, I mean, come on, don't, don't be, no, I'm not. Yes. No. Uh, right, Colin Malani's with us. Colin, good morning to you. How are you? Hi, lads. How's it going? You were doing commentary of the Derry game. I was there. Yeah. Uh, very enjoyable. Um, Derry probably could have gone four, even five up in the first 20, 25 minutes. They had plenty of chances. Uh, Treaty hung in there, then they got their penalty in the half hour mark. And then from then on, it was kind of nervy on Derry's part, even though they still had a lot of chances. But uh, Jack Brady and goal for Treaty made a lot of really good saves to keep them in the game. But um, I think it'll be a good cup final. I think uh, Shelburne and Waterford was. Um, it was in difficult conditions, so it probably wasn't the best game in the world to watch. But Shelburne are going to be really difficult to beat for Derry City, even though Derry probably will be uh, favourites, you would think, for that. But um, yeah, it's been a good uh, cup campaign and obviously probably what went under the radar yesterday to some extent, given that the cup semi-finals run is that Shamrock Rovers dropped points against Drogheda, um, which brings Derry right back into contention for the league title. If they win their game in hand, they're three behind and uh, they play each other on Sunday week in Tallaght. Right. So This is the one. Right. Yeah. Great. Tala. 
So now Derry need to win all their games. Yeah, and Derry have a tough run in. I think they've got um, Shells, Sligo Rovers, and St. Patrick's. Shells are going to put well. out a, a good team in that. Is that before the cup final? Yeah, the they play final? Shells on uh, Friday, play Shells Friday night. Yeah. As you say, away to Sligo, and then the game against Rovers uh, in the penultimate game of the season. Now, you know, even as somebody who goes to Rovers all the time, I'm like, I want it to be on the balance that night. I think everyone kind of wants yeah. there to be even three points. I know Rovers have a better goal difference, but if she, if Derry get the victories, they close that. I think it's only five at the moment. Mm. So yeah, this is going to be good. It's slightly nervy, yeah. It's slightly nervy for Shamrock Rovers, but it's great for the league. I mean, from a from a neutral standpoint, it's fantastic. Uh, Derry are really, really good, really good. Uh, Michael Duffy was excellent yesterday, and. Uh, Brian Maher and goals. They've got so many good players around the pitch. And Will Patching was suspended yesterday as well. He's had a brilliant season. So Well, it's really good for the league as well for the next couple of seasons because there was a feeling that maybe Shamrock Rovers, uh, with their financial backing, with how well set up they are with their academy system, the conveyor belt of talent coming through, that they may just go and dominate for the next four or five years. But obviously Derry have got themselves a billionaire owner. They've got you know, Michael Duffy, maybe the best player in the league right now. Uh, McElhaney, McGonagall, like they have any amount of talent. Mm. And you'd have to expect that they're going to invest again For like sure. Derry produces an insane amount of good footballers who all want to go back home as well mm. like maybe there's a maybe there's a return for James McLean who eventually says screw this I'm sick of this uh, abuse every single week when I'm having the in the best form of my life uh, I'm gonna uh, he will go back home I'm no doubt to yeah, Derry I, I don't think it'll be so, next yeah. season but because he's at the, the Brandy well pretty regularly isn't he so it wouldn't be a surprise at all and uh, like Damien Duff at Shelburne is brilliant as well for the league yeah, that's yeah. fantastic and like it'd be great Little if Shelburne, Shelburne. It'd be Little great if Shelburne Shells. could become title contenders over the next couple of seasons under Duff. Like that would be It'd be tough. It'll be incredibly difficult for him to yeah. Yeah. But does does Duff go from little old shells to big old rovers at some stage? No. No. It's not gonna do that. I don't saying, think no. he's been at Rovers before, hasn't he? He's been, been at Rovers. Very, yeah. very good relationship. Uh, Stephen Brad even said he was hoping the Shells go on and win the cup. Such as his closeness of his relationship yeah. with Duffer. No, yeah, well, I mean, he's not going to take Bradley's job then. No, I'm, I'm uh, here. Nobody, no. I don't think anybody at uh, Shamrock Rovers wants rid of Stephen Bradley. I'm saying if Stephen Bradley himself decides over the coming years he had that opportunity to go to Lincoln, if he were to move on, like maybe Duffer's prime to take on, you know, a big job. Maybe, maybe, maybe. We'll see. Wow. Shots fired from the Rovers fan. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just quoting. Damien Duff is the one who said it's a little old Shelburne, not yeah, well, me. They, I just, thought they were a big club. They've just come up from their first division. Uh, well, little old Shelburne was him obviously uh, saying what everybody else said. A sleeping Nobody giant. Ever says it. Well, Johnny Ward called well, him sleeping giants. We still going back to that. We are, yeah. You got to take it where you can get it. Um, can we get a shout out for Celtic's legendary Japanese King Nakamura? Says Zen TV in our YouTube comments. Who has announced he's retiring at the end of the Japan season, retiring at the age of forty-four. Ooh. Wow, hero. Love the free kick, didn't he? Um, there for like the biggest of the European nights where it was Strachan really that team that was or was it before that even a uh, free kick against United United wasn't it yeah to both games against Manchester United in the same season one at Old Trafford and then one at Celtic Park got them through but like the free kicks were insane they were about 35 yards out boom top corner not bad 44 yeah 44 still going Um uh, Arsenal very very lucky yesterday says Bobby Dwyer Spurs fan uh, Bamford's goal should never have been disallowed their luck will run out I mean you know that's uh, you're praying there Bobby as opposed to it's not, not quite based on facts Tennis Tank says I'm a Liverpool fan let's not forget City dominated large parts of the game I think City are going to dominate large parts of most games that be football uh, Rogers is some of the worst wide receivers in the league says Chris straight stuff into the bread basket and they're dropping them stuff straight into the bread basket and they're dropping them well not always uh, Aaron Rodgers is also a weirdo and at some point um, you know his, is Tom Brady not? Uh, well Tom Brady's kind of like a cyborg he's kind of the American football version of Haaland uh, there's a great piece on um, is it Bleacher Report or somebody where they're, they're like predicting what he was saying I didn't leave my wife and kids to be being beaten by Kenny Bloody Pickens. That's what they're suggesting he was saying on the sidelines. Right. So, does it, you know, Brady's getting divorced. Yeah, I've, I've, I've read. Uh, like, Mahomes and Allen last night, is that, is that not the big talking point? Is that what everyone in America is talking about? Or is, is Tom Brady just still I think, such a superstar that I him Brady, losing the rag? Tom Brady's still Tom Brady. And they, like, the Pittsburgh team aren't very good at the moment. Their best defender's uh, not fully fit and their new young quarterback isn't great yet and he had to go off injured and they replaced him and they still got beaten. Um, and you can't take the day off. No days off. That was like Bill Belichick's thing. is like, I'm taking the day off every week. And then he showed up the first week but that was just because he knew he had this wedding coming and then went to the wedding. Can't be going to weddings. 
just can't do it. It's Robert Kraft's wedding. I'd say it's a good wedding. I'd say there's a bit of that where, you know, Brady never got paid very much when during the time there, and they, oh, they always managed to. So maybe there's something down the line where they're going so to So he's do, turning up, and instead of giving him the 150 quid in the envelope, he's... he's is like, no, he's, yeah. he's going by himself, so he's only given the, the 75. Well, you know, now. it's cheaper. I'm only, only one place. Uh, I'll never not be amazed at an intelligent man who spend years meticulously planning tactics, strategies, media training, learning language, just completely and utterly lose the plot on the sideline. Pep and Klopp should be in the red. Ridiculous stuff. I thought they were talking about David Brady. Hey. Uh, the club situation yesterday, um, Carl. Yep. Some big headlines. Some as expected, and all comes down to Shane Walsh. If you if you could have written a script, there you go. Shane Walsh like being stitched up in the back of an ambulance to come back out in the second half and kick the winners in the second half. Maybe not the actual winner. Did he kick the actual winner as well? He kicked the winner at the end. That's right. He got four points, there. didn't he? Yeah, so I think three in the second half, yeah. and they win by a point. Carl, you watch a lot of these club games. Would Kilmacud have won the Dublin Championship if Shane Walsh hadn't signed for them? Probably not. There we go. Not if Paul Mannion wasn't there. Paul Mannion was sat in the sideline there, in the so rain. Probably not. Uh, disappointed for Nafina, obviously. They're trying to make the breakthrough back. and uh, It was really tight, wasn't it? Like 11-10. Uh, I believe it was very tactical. Uh, there wasn't too many goal chances from what I hear. So I was flicking across to it, and every time I flicked across, uh, Johnny Cooper was, was involved in something. I'll watch Johnny Cooper play club I don't want to watch many people play club football on TV, but I'll watch Johnny Cooper as he's getting in shame all his face again and again. Just the constant niggle out of him. Uh, and Nafina missed a couple of great chances as well like the conditions were as they seem to be everywhere yesterday yeah, absolutely they atrocious uh, and they missed a couple of really kickable points when they had a chance to push properly clear and you thought the Kilmacud were right on the ropes uh, but yeah Shane Walsh biggest club in the country wins wins the Dublin Championship it's not a, not a surprise this is a story I don't know if it's a story I mean uh, are you, you, you're from the competing hinterland is there no is, no no is there... Um, we're a small club trying to do our best you know with are you, are you jealous? Is, absolutely not. Of the big numbers they have? Of, of Kilmacud? No. Yeah. No, where's, like, you know, isn't the GEA all about, you know, small hinterlands and... But they're a super club. Exactly. Well done to them. Yeah. So basically, this is like Man City winning. Exactly. You said it, not me. Well, I, I mean, I'm just it, it, I'm explaining it, it, well, what it you're is. saying. Like they, they, they have the most amount of players. They have the most members. They should be winning these things, shouldn't they? Are Nafina the... Because uh, you know the north side uh, a little bit better than I do. Are they the Kilmacud of the north side? I don't know. I, I don't know the numbers that of Nafina. not Vincent's until your relegation? Vincent's would be, uh, be a normal-sized club compared to, like, we don't have... But Vincent's don't have loads and loads and loads and loads of pitches around the place. There's I don't know what the answer to Kilmacud is. Yeah. Like, should there be more clubs? I, I do ask this all the time because you go across, say, the south side, you go from Kula to Kilmacud to Ballyboden uh, to Jude's. Like, you're talking in between there with Ballyboden and Kilmacud. You know, between the two of those clubs alone, probably more players than the vast majority of counties have at this stage. Yeah, true, true. At underage level, like, is it is it more clubs or is it actually... Well, in fairness to the bigger clubs, it's very hard because they're so established now to go and try and break them up. Yeah. would be very unfair. Yeah, I would such say. facilities and yeah, uh, exactly such a good structure around their coaching and yeah. around their volu- getting all the volunteers on board. But it does make it inevitable, right? That like they there's a certain sense of inevitability that they're going to start winning everything over a period of time, and then it becomes self fulfilling when you can get the best talent from outside the county. Well, that's the bigger question. Like, should Shane Walsh isn't uh, the, the only? interesting proposal I heard around Shane Walsh and he can do what he wants or sign for who he wants obviously mm. uh, is if you're an intermediate player should you have to sign for an intermediate club now he'd never do it if that was the case but Shane Walsh isn't an intermediate player like he's one of the best players in the country if you play for an intermediate club yeah I know yeah. what you're saying yeah. but again I think that kind of penalises the player for the club yeah. and then the that's point. life that's the GEA isn't it how many players have been penalised from <laughs> the club they were born into <laughs> yeah well you know you do get to play for your county then exactly he still gets to play for his county um, yeah, I don't know. I suspect something will happen though with players that aren't from Dublin transferring to Dublin clubs. That something it's too something. late now. The horse is bolted. They're going to be an All Ireland champion out of this. Yeah, like who's going to stop them? Well, was, was yesterday to prove everyone uh, wondered would Kilma could have won the All Ireland last year if Shane Walsh was there? Would he have got uh, them over the line? Yeah. Well, actually, he got them over the line yesterday in an incredibly tight game. Yeah. Well, he's so good, and fair play to him. And con- congratulations to everybody involved. Nathan's not in the slightest bit bitter. Uh, what else? Anything else from the club that stuck out? 
Uh, yesterday, well, in women's football, Burris Shul won the Mayo title for the first time. Six points to 1-2, I think, was the full-time score. That game was at the Connex Centre of Excellence in quite bad conditions yesterday. Um, lots of, I think there was 15 county finals yesterday. St Finbars and Cork won the hurling again, first time in 29 years, I think, which is a big breakthrough for them. Uh, dreadful conditions down there as well. I think there was flooding around Parky Cueve uh, after the game yesterday. So, I mean, 15 county finals yesterday. I think, again, it's another illustration of the benefit of the split season there seem to be really good attendances across the board as well um, and you know all things considered another successful weekend for the club but the All-Ireland Club champions you mentioned Kilmer Cook Croaks Kilku uh, came through after extra time in the down final yesterday by 113 to 15 so they're still alive well, a high scoring game wasn't it well we could see a, well after extra time we could see a, <laughs> we, uh, we could see a repeat then hopefully uh, that would be good uh, rivalry maybe somebody else who can like Dream at least of taking down the the mighty unstoppable juggernaut that is Kilmacock Cross. Look at look at the hurling. Look at Ballyhale. Have you been to Ballyhale? I actually have never been. to You've Ballyhale. never been to Ballyhale. I've been to Ballyhale a couple of times recently. We went down to the show down there. Yeah. Like there's not much going on in Ballyhale. Like they, since the bypass happened, when I was down there just before COVID, there was literally nothing in the village. There was no shops at that stage because, and I think they again shows the brilliance of Ballyhale. They all got together and created a community shop yeah. and a little coffee shop where people could go in, not for profit, so that there'd be an outlet within the village, yeah. uh, which shows what they're all about. Yeah. But like, ever since the village was bypassed, like there's there's no great enterprise there or anything like that. So to be able to uh, produce maybe the two best hurlers of all time? Certainly. Uh, it's people, unbelievable what they do. People in the like, there's conversation. No, I think they're doing fundraising at the moment, but there was no Astro. There was no Astro pitch down there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just get on with it. Yeah, it turns out the facilities are all you need. Uh, the big breaking news this morning is that it's been confirmed that Bernard Dunn is going to look after the uh, high-performance boxing unit in India. Kelly Harrington has um, tweeted her disappointment at this. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that a little bit later on. It had been mooted a while back, and I wish him all the very best. Uh, Bernard's a great fella and really deserve to be treated better by Irish boxing, but he's been treated the same way that uh, several people before him, all the way back to Gary Keegan, who basically invented the high-performance unit. So, you know, when the same outcome keeps happening, you have to wonder what is the cause of that. And you'd have to say that uh, boxing in Ireland doesn't know how to deal with its talented uh, coaches and administrators. OTBAM brought to you live uh, each morning with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Up next, Alan Quinlan talking rugby. First, here's David Myler telling us about fanboying the former Liverpool winger Harry Kewell, much to his wife's amusement. Enjoy. Just before COVID, I was on a family holiday in Portugal and I saw Harry Kewell in the airport. Um, and I said to my wife, oh, that's Harry Kuehl. He used to play for Liverpool. I want to get a photo. And she went, oh, David, grow up and leave him alone. He's with his family. Um, but I still do it now. If I see someone that I have huge respect for, that I admire, then I'll ask him for a photo, no problem. Um, I met Sergio Garcia, had a chat with him for the Champions League final in Paris. Got a photo with him um, because I like my golf. Um so I've had I've had different occasions. It just depends. I think some I've handled well, some I haven't handled well. Um, certainly in my early days of playing football, when I would go home to Cork or whatever, and I'd be on a night out, people would want to chat to you, and you kind of like, well, I'm coming home to see my friends, and they can kind of take it the wrong way. Um, it's it's a tricky situation. Yes, they kind of say, well, these people admire you, but at the same time you kind of just want your own peace and tranquility and to relax and go and watch something. I know the instance you're talking about with Roy at the American football where you know, somebody's come up to him and he's kind of said, leave me alone. But then again, he's he's gone all the way to London to watch the game. And it's kind of like, I'll do it when I have time or when you know there's a pause in game. I actually want to watch the game because usually it starts, if you do one, then everyone else wants a cut as well. So you end up doing 20 or 30. Um, but then again, it kind of, there's levels to your fame and I certainly wouldn't have had ever in my life the amount of people come up to me that Roy would it's uh, David Myler talking there um, about meeting Harry Kuehl and uh, Roy Keane at the American Football now Alan Quillen is with us normally, that smile that's look right. at that smile yeah, we haven't seen that for a while Munster oh. normally in the red not in the red at all yeah, well, Munster the, win Liverpool win the other reds wow, yeah, he's, uh, yeah. he's a happy man chef. today I've had a few miserable <laughs> Sunday evenings the last few weeks but um, you're back baby yeah my son's uh, rugby and soccer hadn't been going well either so that was compounding the pain but uh his game, the opposition never showed up yesterday, so they had a training match. 
back then for Liverpool. Um, the only thing blemished uh, thing that was missing was Newcastle beating United <laughs> one nil. That's just for my mates now, not for everybody online. I don't have any sympathy really when it comes to Dublin uh, GA rugby or soccer, and the team don't turn up, and you have to have a training game. When I think back to being from Mayo, and we'd get the bus up to Ackle. That's a different story. And the referee wouldn't turn up, and they wouldn't play the game. Two and a half hours on the bus. Tough luck, lads. Off you go. Yeah, that's a different, different scenario for sure. But um, The Banshees of Inish Aaron. That's it. Um, where did the performance come from? Was it, was it brewing? Was it the fact that the, the young lads were back and suddenly they're not taking any of the nonsense? What happened? It's, it's hard to put your finger on it. I think, in, in, in essence, the last few weeks... Um, uh, this is Munster we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leinster winning in Galway on Friday night. We can talk about that in a minute. Um, I'm getting a few clips for talking about Munster too much and not talking talking a Connacht up a bit more from last week. But um, yeah, I think a little. Obviously, the emerging Ireland players come back. They bring a little bit of spark. I think, um, and I think you know sometimes you keep kind of uh, fighting and digging in and trying to fix things in training and stuff like that. We haven't seen the. You know the the proper level of emotion and kind of work rate and 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 intensity in the matches and I think from the word go um, on Saturday night I just thought there was a different there was a bit of a spring in their step um, and obviously being at home helps you know what I mean um, and there's a fear factor with with playing the Bulls that um, if you're not physically right so it was a test they needed a physical test that they needed. And, uh, you know, they perform very well. I think there was mistakes and some... The line-outs are concerned for me when they get into kind of crucial areas. And, and that was a big problem for Connacht in Galway on Friday night. Um, the emphasis on the set piece. And we're seeing a lot, a lot of teams now, Joe, right across the board where, you know, three or four line-outs a game, you lose it and it's kind of not really talked about. Um, it used to drive me absolutely demented if we, if we didn't get close to... You know, it's a full full return on your lineouts. It's fixable though. The lineouts is a kind of generally. It's yeah, a... I think it is. I think um, in a sense with lineouts, I think it's more of an understanding from everybody. It isn't just as simple as you make a call and you call to the right area. It's everybody kind of seeing opportunities where the right place to throw the ball is before the call is made. If you understand, and um, it's just getting people more aware of that. Listen, the, the competitiveness of the opposition right across the board at all levels now, and in, in not just in the professional game in rugby, um, everybody's throwing players in the line out. They're a lot better at reading where where it goes, but um, they're just crucial areas that you need to get right. Yeah. Okay. The team selection was interesting in that um, it it had a mix of the uh, the players who've been there the whole time, but it also got as many of the young players into the team as much as possible, and. Like that's, I think, what gives Munster fans most confidence that this isn't just a flash in the pan. That actually, this is these are a group of players who are going to be conditioned in the new way of of like being ball playing, of trying to take options, of of not falling back. So a lot of people were saying Munster need to fall back on their defence ahead of this game. And they need to go back to being Munster, and it was like, <clears throat> oh, because if you go if you go back, that that's a given trapped. anyway. That's a given, Joe, <clears throat> with any team. It's a basis for any team in any sport. You want to be kind of solid. You want to be cohesive defensively. You want good communication, and you want that kind of. It's the same in any sport, in GA, in soccer, and in, in hurling. You need to have a little bit of an edge about you, and you need to work together and defend when you have to. One of the hallmarks of of, of any great team for me is when you don't have the ball. Um, how you defend, and whatever sort of success we had in previous times at Munster, a lot of that was built on really just been so solid defensively against teams when they were even really really um, exciting teams we played against and I think that's that's your foundation your set piece your breakdown and that physicality and organisation defence and any coach will tell you that so that's something you got to continuously work on I thought the attack was so much better the other night some of the stuff we saw in the second half in particular if that was the All Blacks or if it was uh, to lose, you'd be saying, "Wow, that's brilliant!" No, the f- the end product wasn't there, and I thought Carberry was outstanding. And I think he was really good, wasn't he? Yeah, he was outstanding, and I think he's he was he was just so active and so alive and so um, switched on in a sense. When you look at him again against Zebra a few weeks ago down in Cork, it was. Yeah, was been put in at full back, maybe a bit of a kick up the ass for him. Not really, I think, because I think. He, 
I'll say this again, Nathan. I keep saying it a lot. If your forwards are not winning collisions, if they're not getting you a little bit of front football, generating a bit of momentum, it's difficult for backs. Obviously, the basics of... You know, not is catch- your point though that like by picking him full back, it's like you're not guaranteed to be well, a 10 Well, that's that that actually you know if Ben Healy uh, continues well. to play well, yeah. we're just going to stick with him when it comes around to Champions Cup time. Or Jack Crowley, who came mm. on off the bench the other night and looked, he looked really good. Yeah, yeah, he looked really good. Is he an option at centre? Um, yeah, definitely. Like, should they just pay, pay pay him now as a centre and get him in the team after that? It's a possibility because. Um, Look what Connacht did with Hawkshaw and 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 um, Jack Carty and Connor Fitzgerald having three three out halves. At least you know it gives you more options. Obviously, when you come up against a big twelve, who's going to be trying to run out over you? But I think Crowley is uh, out of the three of them is probably the most physical. I think he's very very strong in contact. He's a big fella as well, and he's he's good defensively as well. So um, yeah, I think look, Carberry was really good, and I was pleased for him because um, you know you. You don't need this uncertainty to keep going. I think his animation and and his ability to read and scan, and we've spoken a lot about Johnny Sexton's big strength, about the ability when there's something going on here to look ahead and be able to play. And I think Carberry organised really well, but he had options. And I think, look, the attack is always going to take a little bit of time, Ger, and it probably will. And they could cut tumbling back down to earth on Saturday against against Leinster. But I think they've got to keep working on what they're doing and really make sure that um, they keep a high level of that fight that they brought the other night. You know, one of the things that they can really take out of the game is the way they defend it at the end. And there is no situation here where anyone's shouting from the roof that months are back, they're going to win every game for the rest of the season, they're going to be great. They still have a lot of work to do, but at least they have a little bit of foundation. And again, some people online saying, well, the Bulls are useless, the Bulls are useless. Oh, it was a template. That doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, the Bulls... Other useless teams might have been... Were 28-0 up against Connacht a few weeks ago. They beat the Lions in the round one out the, the gate. Um, we saw what they did to Leinster last year. Um, they have a very, very strong side. Mentally, were they all, all there? I thought it was a worse situation for Munster that... Glasgow actually beat him the week before in 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 Edin- in Glasgow. I said that's you know they're not going to lose the two games. Jake White is going to hop off him all week, and he was very vocal in in challenging him. But I just thought Munster, even with a lot of, a, a lot of good teams right across the league, would have struggled, not with the quality entire quality package that they had the other night, but did serious fight, did serious work rate, stuff that was missing. And I think you asked me a few weeks ago, Nathan, about the fitness levels. Mm. That has been a problem. So they haven't had ch- time to kind of do what they want to do and get the conditioning right. They're probably getting a bit fitter the way they're training. Um, so, again, it's, you know, it'd be brilliant for them if they could get somebody else but Leinster on Friday night and it's next Saturday. But, you know, nobody will expect them to beat Leinster, but they need a good performance. They need some positivity out of that game what's uh, a dog bowl's upper ceiling his upper season ceiling is uh, it's hard I said a couple of years ago that Thomas Ahern was a potential British and Irish line and some people kind of went whoa but I see stuff in him that and we saw him coming off the bench the other night Thomas Ahern I think what he did in uh, South Africa um, I know you have to be careful with talking about it. It isn't international rugby and there's the opposition and all that. But I think he has that a potential. I think he needs to get run of games, a bit a bit of steeliness about him, if you like, for Thomas Ahern. I think Odogbo, from what I've seen, um, the power, you, he, it's hard to kind of buy that power and get Irish players with that explosiveness. Um, he's only a kid. He's going to get much stronger. Yeah, He's six foot seven. 120 kilos or, or something like that and he's explosive so we've seen a lot of second rows come into the teams early and then suffer badly with injuries for a long period of time so it, we just want to make sure that they manage that progression into the team yeah and I think he needs well to work with coaches can. and stuff and, and um, you know obviously he'll come onto the radar of, of of the Irish selectors now and someone like Paul O'Connell kind of reviewing his game or yeah. you know Graham Rowntree Andy Kiriakou I think the key for a lot of these players is is it's not about managing them all the time and saying, oh God, we take him out of this game, take him out of that game. 
I, I think it's just managing their understanding in a game and they'll get better and um, they'll get stronger and fitter as well. So I think a dog with ceiling is, is very high. Uh, Tugburn in the back row, is that is that the future? Like, well, it, or, or is well, there... Well, if R.G. Snyman is available, um, I'm playing John Klein and R.G. Snyman in the second row. Right. And I'm putting Tugburn in the back row because you don't have the front row that Leinster have or some of the other teams have. The power, the explosiveness, the experience, the international quality. So you try and pick a bigger pack and if you have two big second rows, powerful second rows, that's adding a little bit of weight and support to them. And Bourne can play in the back row brilliantly. Assuming everybody's fit and that's a big assumption for next week, pick the back five for me against Leinster. Assuming everybody, including Snyman. Not Snyman, not Snyman, sorry. Okay. We don't think Snyman's going to be back, um, but it, like a dog will look like he picked up a knock at one point and then... I'm sure, he, hopefully he's fine. But let's say Klein, Dogbo, Hearn, Tygburn, Jack O'Donoghue, Omani, and... I'd probably pick uh, Thomas O'Hearn and, and John Klein. Right. And Byrne, O'Mahony and Coombs in the back row. Okay. That'd be interesting. Um, I just think, you know, this is... Yeah. Even though we say managing the situation, I think maybe have a Dogbo coming off the bench. Um, because the, the, the danger here at 19, and, and he probably hasn't been that conditioning piece needs to work for him a bit keeping him involved and in and out of the, the, the kind of group and close to it has to happen um, just because he's in the academy we shouldn't assume now that he should slip back down because there's a few more second rows involved and the same with Ruan Quinn he's only 18 um, serious potential but you know again there has to be you have to be a bit careful with these younger players but it gives a bit more positivity doesn't it when you have some of the younger players still major issues you know where's the hysteria Quinny where's the hysteria of recent weeks that's what Peter O'Mahony's been saying it's all hysteria no it hasn't no matter what what happens going forward um, and they're going to have more problems they're going to lose more games um, the start has been badly managed I think the pre-season has been badly managed the emerging Ireland stuff hasn't helped them they've been the one group that but I did say that sometimes these players if the players come back better players and more understanding of, of what they need to do and their roles well then maybe it'll benefit long term but but they also all came back feeling themselves going we've just come back from this amazing trip where everything's gone really well we've got to work with the Ireland coaches and they come back into this very negative environment but they must have been like well we're not negative life's good for us so that's like you very rarely get a chance in the middle of a season when things are going badly to get an injection of enthusiasm positivity and talent well they needed that because they played 41 players in the first three games which is a fair bit of chopping and changing and the pre-season was, was a lot of that as well so yeah they're better than what, what we, they've shown in the games they've lost um, so that that's something to be positive about and, and but you know they need a little bit of luck with the injuries Calvin Nash someone who, who did really well in the emerging tour as well and there's, there's something about him um, Who's the first choice scrum half at the moment? Uh, I think Craig Casey. It is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Does that impact on Murray for Ireland? Um, it could do. Yeah, I think if maybe Conor Murray is only a couple of um, a couple of games into his season as well, so I don't think it'll it'll kind of rule him out a little bit. I think, um, uh, particularly with the game Munster trying to play at the moment, I, I think he'll still be in the Irish squad, Conor Murray, and if he gets some more game time and shows uh, gets um, up to speed a little bit more I think he'll be on yeah he will be on the bench for South Africa he has that that experience and still has that quality so yeah. but Casey's putting a bit of pressure there um, it's funny Big pressure. Casey might be a potential replacement to start but you can see having Murray's experience as a closer or something that they're they're going to rate very highly um, what about Connacht's performance because uh, they were in the they were in the red in the power rankings a little bit earlier on even though I'd say they might have even covered the spread I'm not sure um, were, were Con- was Connacht's performance bad and disappointing on the wake no, of it was, what happened last it was, week um, or, I think the start of the game it looked like Leinster um, Leinster were going to kind of control the tempo and pace of the game and you know they got an early try I think John Porsche gave away a penalty to break down Leinster kicked it downfield scored from it um, I think they held on and defended really well at times uh, but the big issue for them is, is just being a bit more clinical when they get into the attacking zones and even though Leinster and they have the luxury of doing that they can have four or five internationals or whatever um, off the team and 
have a little bit of rotation, but still right across the board. I thought Ringrose and Van der Fleer, they showed their class when they, critical moments, you know. Um, I thought Connacht missed opportunities and they had moments in the game where they had penalties close to the line. They nearly got there, but they turned the ball over pretty quickly. And you could say, look, that's really good Leinster defence, but I think some of it was self-inflicted and that's the thing that will frustrate him the most in the game, that um, they had real opportunities to build sustained pressure in, in attacking zones and they didn't. They lost lineouts. they turned the ball over, they knocked it on, um, gave away some penalties again. But what they've shown the last two weeks, similar to Munster, they had their big kind of lift against Munster, maybe that Munster had against the Bulls. They were all, It was always going to be really difficult with Leinster. Um, yeah. And it is for everybody. <clears throat> it's ironic, the scheduling uh, is exactly the same Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. So um, to lose 10-0 against Leinster and be really frustrated that you had opportunities, you created opportunities, uh, and you were in really good positions is something to build on. So I thought the desire, the aggression, the intensity that they brought is what they need because they're not as powerful and, and, and don't have the same quality as, as Leinster. So I thought that, yeah, they were outstanding. And probably a little bit naively, they tried to move the ball to the wider channels a lot. Um, and I said this, I was doing the game, uh, doing the, game the other night, they probably should have tried to, you know, get their back row going up the middle of the pitch a little bit. And a couple of times Paul Boyle did that and he was very good. Um, so, look, it was difficult. The conditions were really difficult, but uh, missed never, opportunities. It never rained in Galway. He's very quiet. He's not saying anything. No. Uh, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I was just, it was, it was frustrating. The, the conditions were half. horrendous. But you say, it, because it's Leinster, you just know so often when they got into those dangerous what's areas that Leinster were going to What's unbelievably important for Connacht composed. is to beat the Scarlets on Friday night. Yeah. And then that three-week block looks good. Yeah. You've beaten Lens, you beat Munster. Should have been a losing bonus point. Carthy looks like a, a man putting himself under enormous pressure. I know, like, the kick he's at the end. He's panicking a little bit. There's a bit of, I need a big play and a big match to, yeah. like this to and get myself back in with Ireland. Only two games. I think the Ireland thing's probably gone, I have to say. I think, um, but we'll see. we got to go, but we can talk more, we we'll definitely do more on Ulster. Um, yeah, they were outstanding. On Friday, like, um, a outstanding level in, of excitement in, in, there in right South there. Africa. Really brilliant. Balakoon, Stuart McCluskey, Michael Lowry, Real talent and scoring a lot of tries. Yeah, conceding a few, but yeah, but I'd I'd, I'd love to see them Day all playing for Ireland on Saturday in, in one of the November internationals. Maybe the Australia game. Let's see what let's see what every, that every tier time I see like. Stuart McCluskey, I think, God, he's gonna regret. It's it's he's really unlucky when when you think of the centres of Henshaw, Ringrose, Aki. Yeah, yeah. but maybe um, now it's time. Like Bundy's not going to be around for the November, or is he yeah. back? Uh, no, he's no. not. He's gone. Um, McCluskey's just outstanding the last few weeks. Right. we got to go. Quinny, good stuff. Thanks a million Cheers, for that. Guys. Now, a reminder that uh, Braeburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of Off The Ball. Every week we give one lucky viewer a €100 Euro voucher to spend on some Braeburn Coffee goodness at an Apple Green store near you. To enter, just check out at Off The Ball on Twitter. Like and retweet our Braeburn competition post and you'll be in the draw. Braeburn Coffee never compromises on quality or taste to give you the best on-the-go experience on the road. Coffee experience on the road, sorry. That's available at Apple Green today. Now, the Creasla Community Support Fund has been established by the Irish Red Cross. It's in collaboration with OnPost and Apple Green to provide rapid and long-term assistance to the Creasla community. All donations to this fund will be dedicated to the support of those who've been bereaved, injured, made homeless or left without an income as a result of the tragedy. In the days and weeks ahead, the Irish Red Cross will work with the community of Creasla to ensure that all contributions will be used effectively and as needed to assist those affected by this incident. Please donate to the Creasla Community Support Fund. Uh, 13 minutes past nine, I'll tell you what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio for the rest of the day. Uh, OTB Gold is a golf weekly inside Park Harrington's gaff. Splunk is at three o'clock. Our Culture Hall of Fame is The Wire at four. And OTB Gold is our Lance Armstrong interview. We're going to take a quick break. We're back after these, talking with uh, Paul Galvin about his new book, Threads. First, here is Owen Redden and Brendan O'Brien in the Sunday paper review reflecting Granite Xhaka's remarkable comeback at Arsenal. He's there now and, and do brilliantly. Is this, un, this, this, this is in one way an even better interview than the Dylan Hartley one, which we all loved in the sense that it's a current player. Do you know what I mean? And, and a footballer, and, and a less footballer Premier open, League, yeah. top of the tree, mm. and it's it's all predicated on the fact it's it's nearly three years or more or less three years since that day against Crystal Palace, when 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 he hit a, the the real low with Arsenal, 
Um, and then, you know, having a backstory like that with his dad uh, doesn't hurt either. And it's it's remarkable because you hear guys around the soccer beat in the UK and even here and trying to get access to these guys. There's all these stories there to be told as well and you just never really hear about it. You might see them on Premier League review or preview. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, and and it's like this anodyne quote here and there. Yeah, Do you know yeah. I thought was interesting as well? It's like it's funny like we're talking about the, the complicated politics of Ireland there. Every country's got oh, their own I, stuff going on. That so. confused me actually. I had to read it like three times. Yeah. Is he from A, B or C and where's the dad from and where did they end up? And but it's interesting. So He's, he's 106 caps for Switzerland yeah. and when there was talk of him being potentially made captain a while back the former Liverpool player and uh, Swiss international uh, Stefan Henshaw said he shouldn't be in contention to be Switzerland captain yeah. because he doesn't represent Switzerland so I mean you've crazy all of this stuff Isn't going it? on you know, you know and a, a very multicultural country you know with the three you know French German Italian mm. even before you have the influx of of immigrants into it, like, you know, how many languages do they speak there? So, you know, it goes back to that, you know, what is identity anyway? And uh, especially in a country with that, you know, influx of, of different uh, different influences, you know? Yeah. And Stefan Encho has been in multicultural dressing rooms all his life. Yeah, his you know. Oh, no, he doesn't represent us. Yeah, it's, so, a, it's uh, terrible, terrible not, quote, isn't it? great. Yeah, I hadn't realised that that well, was... I didn't. I'd never heard that before. Part of the debate around Jack. Yeah, so yeah. He's going to be a guitar anyway, so we'll see him again. OTB... AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. OTB Sports Rugby. Hit Connacht last season, going to hit them again this season. They are in the tougher section. Once you could concede we finish eighth, but miss out on Champions Cup. I think it is progressively getting more and more difficult to qualify for the Champions Cup. You certainly can't take it as red, and you certainly can't take it as red when you make a start like Munster. Subscribe to the rugby stream on the OTB Sports app now. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Whatever you grow, we'll save a bro. Right, I'm delighted to say Paul Galvin is with us in studio. It's to help launch his new book. It's called Threads, Clothes and the Irishman, A Woven History. Paul, you're very welcome. Thanks, sure. Having a, a book, I haven't had one yet, but I imagine it's a bit like having a baby. You send it out into the world and you go, I hope this really works. Uh, how, wh- what's it like, giving birth to a book? Yeah, it's a bit like you described there, actually. Yeah. There's a, it's a tough book, actually. It was a tough book to write. And uh, it's a bit of, bit of what you call it. There's a bit of vulnerability to it, actually. Put, putting it out there, you never know. Well, specifically this one, I imagine, because like this is revealing the ideas behind the uh, collections that you've had all the way back, right? So you're explaining what your thought process was. D- did you write a contemporary like at the time when you were doing your collections? You're like, I'm going to write a chapter now, or did you have to go back and revisit what you were doing for the last 15 years? Yeah. Um, well, actually. What I did was I at the beginning, I just treated it as a writing project. Right. So, therefore, I went in with a complete research, writing, storytelling uh, approach to to design, and I figured I would treat each season like a chapter, and at the end, I'd have a book, and the, and the, and that's the book. So, I always intended to write a book from the start. Okay. Right. Um. The other thing about that is that obviously your writing skills change. You hone uh, what you think is good. You develop as a writer and a thinker. Did you go back and read the stuff that you wrote and go, that's really good? Or were you like, oh, I need to change that? Oh, yeah, very, very much so, Ger. I, I think it was actually due last year. Right. And it just wasn't ready, you know. And I looked at the later chapters and they were better than the earlier chapters. Okay. And oh, I thought, no, no. That's kind of crushing in a way, though. It's like It was, it yeah. was. I read back and I thought, oh, no, oh, no. And it was just circumstances, and you had uh, t- time. Just it had it had kind of grown towards the end. So when I look back at the start, I was like, no, no, not good, not good enough. I follow a lot of writers on Twitter, and um, the the thing that gives them community or a sense of community, because it's such a, a um, an individualistic pursuit, is the misery that they talk about, and that they kind of kind of like it's like sweating over every single word so you're never finished until it's it's gone and then you're like and then you find a mistake um, but now it's done you, you've got to let go right there's you a can, bit of therapy not, in this yeah not, it's not easy to even let go then at the end you know what I mean you're still looking at it there and I'm, I was looking at it there on the day I got it and I was like hmm. there was a particular word embroiderer that I didn't use that I meant to use right and uh, and um uh, that was, uh, you know, so anyway, sure, look, that's that's the nature of it. I wouldn't claim now to be the most experienced writer either, do you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I think two books I'm certainly not the best, the best one either, so... 
you know, I, I, uh, I would, I would defer now to greater writers, and there's a lot of very, very good Irish writers actually, and sports writers. I think we're blessed with really great, some really great sports writers in in Ireland in in the sports media, and you know, I would often drop Michael Foley a line now, for instance, Sunday Times. Not often, I should say, but now and again, he's a guy who has, um, from the point of view of grammar and punctuation, and just. Uh, structure and all that. Uh, I think a talent, Paul Howard, another one like Paul. Paul's a great writer. I used to really enjoy Paul's work. Yeah, and he needs uh, to write more sport though. It's funny. Maybe yeah, Roddy also come back in. I wouldn't disagree with you. I wouldn't disagree with you. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And um, the Examiner do some good stuff. I think as well, and 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 have have some good writers. Do you know, I think Colin Sheridan's a good. Yeah, really Colin interesting. Take on life. A good, good writer. Yeah. Uh, Eamon Fitzmaurice, my brother-in-law, does some good stuff. So. Uh, a lot, a lot of, I stop naming names now because I'll, I'll, I'll upset somebody that, write, that I don't uh, mention. Were you when you were playing? Uh, I, I, I was an interest at all. It's like, you know, this is just really a product of my interest, really, in terms of what I've been doing for the last 10 or 12 years. So I would write, I would have read definitely bits and pieces. I would have, I would have not read them for a long time, really. I wouldn't have not engaged. But then my interests are, you, you, know, you know what I mean? Good writers are good writers. You want to Keith Duggan, another guy. I thought Keith Duggan. I think Keith Duggan is is a great writer. Uh, so Maliki, another good one. So I would have tuned in from time to time. Yeah, yeah. Especially if the piece is a good piece. Like it doesn't matter. I never had an issue if a person was writing about me. If a person ask, wrote about me and it was how do you not good not, or whatever? How do you how do you train yourself not to? Well, I I never had a major problem if if a, if a guy wrote a piece and it was true. I'd say it's true, but he's right. I never had an issue with that. I, I, I felt if a guy wrote something that wasn't true or wasn't fair or wasn't balanced, I, I, I often would have picked up the phone now. I would have picked would up you? the okay, phone. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. um, like we've, we've had people complain about stuff that we've said over the years, and it's like it's afterwards you go, okay, it's hard to find a balance because we don't, we don't know you, you know? Like we, you're, you're involved in an incident, or player X, X is involved in an incident, and people draw conclusions on the basis of that incident. But that's one flashpoint in like uh, life's body of work it's very difficult for anybody outside the dressing room or your teammates or people who've known you for a long period of time to really know you so it, you know I true 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 like you know I'd say you were ringing a lot of people were you <laughs> <laughs> no no not by any means my god not by any means but there was a couple of conversations now like there was a couple of you know where I wouldn't have been happy, and I told the person, and yeah, I yeah. wouldn't have wouldn't have held back at all. But then, I was always. I would have only done that if I felt I had a strong point and a, and a, and a reasonable point. I, when I was out of order, and it was, I would never challenge it at all. If anybody from the Kerry team or the Dublin team or whoever was sitting down with you now having a coffee, and they asked you about your approach to media, what would what would you say to them? Right now, today. Yeah, would you give them? Would you tell them to do what you did and read the bits, or would you advise them for the short period of time that they're, you have your window, just ignore it. What What's the right? I mean, it's obviously case by case. Mm, I I don't know. Like I think for the best, for the most part, your best to to not to re, be really economical about taking stuff in and reading stuff. I think like yeah. to to avoid it. Like you know what I mean. I I when I see I read bits now. That wouldn't have been very regular. But I might have had to have. I might have had to have read it. Read Why did you have to read it? In general, I would have read stuff out of interest. It mightn't have been about me. I would have, but I would have read guys' work, like you know what I mean, because it was good work. Yeah. If someone wrote something on me, and even if it wasn't the most positive, if it was a good piece of writing, I'd, I'd still go. It's a great piece of writing, though. Um, so I just admire writers and that, like you know what I mean. Yeah. And uh, I don't think that I don't. I don't know the policy regards players, like you know. You just have to. T you have to be very. You have to be removed from it, like you know what I mean. I wouldn't like to see a guy now regularly dipping in, like I just, I don't, I don't think that's a great habit. But I don't think you need to be running away from it either. Can you ever think back to a, a piece that was very complimentary to you? Like, would you think back to been footballer of the year? Like all those writers you're talking about would have written their pieces at the end of the year that would have actually uh, been very generous in their praise yeah. that that stood out. And you go, geez, that was a that that's a nice thing yeah. for people to think about you. Yeah, yeah. I do. I remember. I remember some, and I remember the writers, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, did it have a positive impact? Because it, it's interesting. Um, 
Brian O'Driscoll talks about meeting Enda McNulty and him being at a very low point in his career and they work together and he goes on to have great seasons but one of the things he would make him do is watch videos himself doing really well and it was like just a reminder you know there's greatness here if I if I channel it right and if I if I focus did the positive stuff could you use that in a way yeah yeah I feel you know it feel it feels good and uh, I I I it always felt good now my approach is always the good and the bad you kind of got to you got to like you you know my approach was always leave both leave both slide you know where possible but you know I mean positive stuff is is positive stuff and you you, you know you, you accept it and, and and use it where you can i i um i think i think that's it's silly not to yeah it's funny, isn't it? Because the, it's like, oh, don't don't get too big headed. But actually, you need a little bit of something to help you go and to go. Oh, this listen, is the whole yeah. point. If it's good, take it. Absolutely, take it and and, ca- and carry it with you. Can I ask you about the the book and the circle between writing the book and the story and the design and the finished product and how you go from like there's so many different chapters and stories and say Patrick O'Connell, who people will be aware of, the man who saved Barcelona, and how you go from being interested and fascinated by his story to that ending up in a piece of clothing or something that you can you have a vision for how, how does that happen uh it's a good question uh print would be one way print and probably color then would be another way like you know what i mean you try and take the colors of barca for instance that's one way to try and maybe interpret the blaugrana of barca was one of the kind of how do you go from patrick connell to putting it into the product the blaugrana of of Barca's colours that was in the that was in that Mister collection, and there's print would be another way then that you can tell a story kind of without writing or saying or speaking. Print is a language as well, and could have been low, every season there would be a print. Uh, I think for that one we might have used a little interpretation of the New Camp. Um, Bogman used Pete Briquettes. It was an architect called Tom De Poer who who created this piece of famous in architecture circles famous pavilion called N cubed out of he used 40,000 peat briquettes at the Venice Biennale so that I'm from the bog that story stayed with me uh, so we used peat briquettes one time I mean everybody everybody can rough everybody can relate to a peat briquette I think like you know what it's I mean now, yeah. you know uh, I would have seen Slightly back in sore fingers from yeah no, you know and maybe maybe you'd see one broken off a you know what I mean they were they were weapons like they were they were hard they were hard, hard edged, but I, I print was a thing from the before I started out in the in the industry. Before I started working with Duns, I would have observed a lot of retailers and men's clothing and men's brands like Levi's and O'Neill's and Mitre and Kappa and Clark's New Balance. The New Balance factory was in Tralee. You know, my my godmother worked in the New Balance factory. They made a lot of their shoes in Tralee in the in the eighties and nineties. Right. Uh, so the brands and then I remember going into UK retailers based in Ireland and looking at what was on the shelves before I started in the industry and print was a thing that jumped out you know I'd look at a lot of print and it would be pelicans and bananas and flowers and do you know what I mean I, I would say why 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 a pelican <laughs> why why you know what I mean why 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 don't what print can mean a lot like you know what I mean so I would say print is a great way to create meaning you can do it for clubs and counties you can do it for the guy in the street I think you've got to give you've got to make product mean something especially in a country like Ireland where there's so much cultural um, richness you know so you take something like Luke Kelly you take a man like Luke Kelly Ronnie Drew you know they wore a lot of stuff that you can did a collection on Luke Kelly he he, he had a, a banjo and there was a lot of there was a piece of print on his banjo that we put into shirts so that's sorry a long winded answer Nathan but that's kind of how it might transfer. It's um, a very broad church of, of influence that you're trying to distill down to something that then ends up on the shelves. It's um, basically trying to put everything you know. And uh, how do you eliminate stuff that's not relevant then? You must have too many ideas sometimes. Uh, great. Is that, is, that the, is that the benefit of having the chapters in that, like, you actually get to, if, that, if something doesn't fit a chapter, you can keep it for another yeah. one? Yeah, it's a good, there's a good deal of editing. I, it's very like publishing, I think, the design the design stuff with Duns or whatever I'm doing. It's very like publishing. I always thought I always thought it as publishing, so th- therefore there's a good degree of editing as well then. And you would say, no, 
or yeah, next. So I would have. I had a lot of those in my head anyway. I knew for years ahead. So I thought that won't work there, but this will be the next one that will work there, and I could see it all for, for a couple of years. So, so, and then you have good teams, buyers, design team, buying team, marketing team, shareholders meetings, and a good deal of editing will happen there as well. So it's not just me, like by any means, you know. Yeah, but you end up carrying the can. It's your name over the the top of it. For sure, for sure. How do you you talk about like? Uh, you know, shareholders meetings and all that. Like that's the there's that's the non arty side of it. How do you get that balance between like this is your living, you need to earn a living from it while sort of remaining true to yourself, and that it's not this vampire sucking all the creativity out of you just to make a few quid. Yeah, that's that's where you defer to people with knowledge and experience, and you 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 know what I mean. Uh, I don't. I don't go into meetings, and I. I. I, I don't bluff anybody. You know. You, you. You. You listen well, and there's always a balance between. I always was conscious of the balance between, the storytelling, and trying to say something with a piece of print, and the commercial aspect where. There are strong sellers in the brand that. Might be more, uh, you know, we'll say basic pieces or whatever. Like, and you know what I mean. They're they're the business and the brand, really. You know what I mean. And so you just you just you just watch you just watch what's going on. You see how things perform, and you keep an eye on keep an eye on performance. Basically, it's no different to keeping an eye on a team's performance. You keep an eye on performance, and you see what's working and what's not working. Yeah, yeah. I, I like obviously that means you can continue and have longevity. So there's there's that balance to be struck. Um, now that the book is finished what's next is there another like you know that's a good question um, <laughs> do you get to enjoy it for a while like, uh, I just asked that question only last night um, I don't uh, no I do um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know I don't know I just I tend to move on pretty quickly do you know to the, ne- to the next thing and I'm really focused now on this this stuff and making sure it does do do it do it justice because people Writing is a, is a selfish thing, you know. It's a, or it's an individual thing, you know. You've got to go. You need your headspace. You can't do it without peace and quiet. I wrote a lot of this in my car over lockdown. Honestly, I wrote about fifty thousand words of that in the car. Right. Yeah. Uh, because no, really, there was nowhere else to go. And I have a nice car, and I was like, it's actually a good space for me, and 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 I was able to write, and and but then people around you, then you know, I mean, you might be gone for hours, and I would be gone for hours, so. You got to make sure now that you do it justice and you you give it its give it its time. So that's really my focus at the minute. And then, uh, yeah. What about getting involved at the high level Gaelic football again? Is that part of the agenda in the near future? Uh, yeah, like I uh, absolutely high in my in terms of my interests and in terms of what I what I love and what I enjoy. It definitely is. Uh, Something that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. I, I think about a lot, and I'm, I'm, I'm. I do, I, I do intend to, and I do want to. Soon, you know, wh- wh- where, where, and when exactly? I, I don't know. I was interested to like the the intercounty management experience and the coaching experience are very different things, right? Uh, is there a part of you that would prefer to be a coach next time, or now that I haven't had the managerial experience, like? understand exactly what the pitfalls are, understand exactly what the terms of engagement need to be with the various stakeholders. You know, it's not very similar to business. Like, I'd say it's right. almost exactly the same. Right. So which would you prefer now? Would you would you rather use that experience or rather never have that experience again or not in the short term? <laughs> um, I, I, I wouldn't be away. I wouldn't be... Um, I really, I really love the coaching part. Really love it. Uh, certainly, there's aspects of the management part. I can I could take or leave. I think most managers would say that. Uh, there is a lot. There's a lot of uh, c- communications and phone calls and emails and that part, the management part. You know what I mean? You wanna you wanna you wanna love that. You wanna be you wanna be able for that and 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 and, and okay with that, okay with that do you know what I mean and have time have time for that I should say yeah like yeah. Nathan used the word vampire about creativity I'd say that is the part of ma- intercounty management that most managers uh, a year in are like oh my god all I want to do is get this team to play this this way get that lad to play that way and we're going to be very successful but instead 
and like, well, it's Stuart Lancaster yeah. from England to Leinster, from yeah, being the administrator to the guy, yeah. boots on the ground. Yeah, good experience. Like, you know what I mean? I think, look at, I mean, it's the way to probably do it anyway. Do you know what I mean? You look at Ron and Ron Nogara, what what he has done. He, I think he, his career is is, is one I, I really admire. You know, he's he has put in his time at at, at a coaching level, and now he's there at a management level. He's probably doing as much coaching anyway. But I remember, I remember a manager, an inter-county manager, a number of years ago, saying, "Just delegate that stuff." You know, you get, you, yeah, there's someone for that job. You know what I mean? And uh, the I, thing is, I'm not sure there is for everybody, right? If you're if you're the physio and you need to talk to the manager about a player, and the manager has delegated that to a third party, you're well, not going to uh, be a very happy physio. No, I wouldn't include the physio part, definitely not. But I would say up, up, managing upwards, maybe the, um, you know the. Logistics, the logistical stuff. Definitely, yeah. The fixtures, the, yeah. the <clears throat> where they need to be, what time. Yeah, all yeah. that, all that stuff. I think, yeah. yeah. And um, so, I don't know, Jar. I really don't know at the moment. Only that. Um, kind of based more between Dublin and Kerry now, and my my home and my 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 home clubs and Kerry, and family, have been a big priority for me this year. And we'll continue to be. We're based back in Dublin, so we're between the two. You know what I mean. So, um, what what ha- I don't know what happens next. I don't really know. We will see. There was lots of, uh, you know, like you you can't you can't keep saying no either. You know what I mean. There comes a time where you got to say, right, you got to move on. You got to keep practicing. It's a practice. Yeah. It's a total practice, and I'm, and I and I and I, and I like I like to practice. It'd be more inter county than club, though. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. The club game is the club game's exciting actually. I've seen a lot a lot of club football in Kerry, in Dublin, seen a seen a bit in Mayo and um so I don't I don't know really. Okay. All yeah, right. I don't know. Okay. So watch this space basically. That's um Uh yeah, I think it's a bit of that. I think it's a bit of that. You know, there are a couple of there's been other priorities and, and, and probably to an extent there still is a priority now in terms of this stuff. And then, and then I don't know what will happen next. Does the split season make it a bit more alluring in that actually you could manage it? Like it's very intense for eight months, but actually there's a period of the year where it's less intense, where it's going to matches, and you don't actually have that much. Extra I think so. Be. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think, I I think it's a positive. I think it's a generational thing. I think my 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 father's generation are not so, and not him specifically, but some of his friends were speaking to them recently, and they were. No, they want to go back to the to the traditional calendar. Uh, I'm 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 okay with the I'm okay with the calendar. I I think it's I think it's been enjoyable. The players are really enjoying it. I, mean, I think that's the big one. I think if you played in it, you'd be like, "This, we're never going back, lads." I think so, yeah. and I think and I think that that'll hold. You know, maybe a week or two weeks or whatever it might be. It might go back a little bit. Yeah. In the month, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, the two weeks is is going to be. It's the, overall. I think overall been good. You know. One last thing then about the the evolution of the game. This Kerry team have um, an abundance of talent, and obviously some of the most exciting young forwards in the country. Uh, what's their ceiling? Should like what what should their definition of greatness be? Should it be should it be defined by uh, Kerry's history and tradition? Should it be defined by their own incredible underage records? Um, should it be defined by the dubs? Like what what's when we're talking about them now? We, we maybe maybe this is wrong. We shouldn't have an, an architecture to talk to them. It's like it's their journey and it takes them wherever it takes them. But um, what do you think? I think they're really talented. Uh, they're in a good position. Jack has been exceptional. Uh, you talk about def- defining and what should their. Dublin, Dublin haven't redefined the game, but they've redefined winning, and and I think you know that has to be a a kind of a what would you say a ref, a reference or a, an inspiration. I think what Dublin did was highly hugely inspiring. I really do, and and I think if you were a player today, I just think God, I w- I would be on a high. I would be saying, Wow, look, six. Yeah. I didn't even realise. You know, my w- my wife recently informed me it was six. <laughs> And she's not a football woman, no. Really well, that's because she's from Mayo, trust me. You know, we know exactly how many it was. I, for whatever reason, had forgotten. I, I, I thought it was five. Yeah. And I thought, wow, what the, an achievement. The COVID one, no one can If I was a player I, right now in Kerry, I'd be very excited. I'd be very excited because of what they've got, uh, because of Jack, and because of what just happened.
I'd be saying, I'd be saying, you've got to be inspired by, I, I went in back in 04, whenever 03, and I had seen what Armagh did, what Tyrone did, what Meath had done uh, to the game. They took the game apart, like, you know what I mean? They just really, they, it's like they took the game apart and put it back together. And I watched all that at close quarters and I thought, if I get a chance here, I'm going to I'm gonna go for this big time because the, the, the rules were rewritten in a way yeah. by those teams. And I think Dublin have rewritten the rules of winning. So, I'd say you'd write a chapter on David Clifford, no problem for the next book. Yeah, well, well, just very proud of him. Very proud. He's a Kerry, he's a Kerry player. Uh, give, give, gives us, gives us, and Paddy. I have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm just as good. Honestly, I think the guys, I think the guys, a really exceptional player. But yeah, pr- proud of him, and and uh, fantastic to watch, fantastic to listen to as well. Yeah, good fella. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and um, like that, it seems to be enjoying watching the success and leaning into like being good and leaning into being great as opposed to like ah you know there's no there's no arm's length from his own talent which is very rare and um, it's very endearing as well don't the- bury the lead Jer. don't bury the lead Friday night Colin Farrell oh yeah <laughs> were you out in the town do you know what Brendan Gleeson I wasn't and I, I, I missed the trick there wow, they, were, they were just absolutely really I was just so impressed with them in terms of their class and their graciousness and do you know what I mean just uh you know, asking questions that, asking smart questions out of kind of manners, like you know what I mean. I was just really, really impressed with the two of them. Now, Brendan, Brendan is a football man. He knows his is GA. He? Yeah, he okay. is. And Colin, Colin did too. Colin right. did too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I, w- I was, I, I think they do Ireland a great service, both of them. You know, immediately you could see their inte- their intellect as actors. You could see it come true in a quick conversation. Very sharp asking great questions out of kind of interest and manners and I thought just do Irish men a, a great service yeah they seem uh, like they're living their best lives in the way you would want people to represent you like yeah yeah yeah. no phenomenal bunch Threads Clothes and the Irishman A Woven History by Paul Galvin is in bookshops right now but I wish you the very best of success with it appreciate it lads thanks for having me uh, OTBM live every morning in association with Gillette in association with Movember effortless shave magnificent mo you can sign up or donate now at movember.com we're back tomorrow with Shane uh, Jack McGrath is going to be in with us more in the Premier League and plenty more besides in the meantime we'll leave you with some of the best from the Sunday paper review enjoy uh, the Mail on Sunday there's an ar- interview here which I think caught everybody it's probably the best interview in the in the pages yeah. uh, this morning by a bit of a distance yeah. so it's Dylan Hartley uh, so he's, he's pictured there in uh, Dubai and the uh, big headline is I get dizzy spells, drop things, stutter but I can't spend all my time thinking I've got dementia 36. So it's not uh, ostensibly just an interview about uh, dementia or any potential issues from playing the game. It's about his new life now and he's he's kind of fascinating on that. So it's Nick Simon who's in Dubai. So Dylan Hartley has now moved to Dubai with his family and they meet for uh, morning coffee in the 37 degree he smart casual ahead of an afternoon of client meetings. We don't at this stage in the piece know what the client meetings are. Uh, Dylan Hartley almost uh, blends in. He is slimmer now with an expensive new hairline. It's a hell of a line just to drop in, isn't it? <laughs> D- Dylan Hartley reading this going, what? Uh, after? <laughs> only his noticeable uh, limp as he drags his right leg sets him apart from the stylish clientele as they glide between the exotic fruits and the Arabian buffet. And then you've uh, straight talking Hartley. My hip is effed, he says, taking a seat, ordering a black Americano. I've got arthritis, so I'm getting a replacement. It's pretty debilitating. I can't walk properly. I don't sleep well. Can't tie my shoelaces. Struggle to play with my kids. Struggle to sit in the toilet. Not that you need to hear about that at breakfast, he starts. So I think right away you know that Hartley's going to be straight talking, Mm. entertaining. And he continues on in that vein. Uh, He politely declines the food, says the piece. Uh, These days Hartley only eats between the hours of midday and 6 p.m., He's uh, opting for a healthier uh, lifestyle. Pub lunches in rural North Hampshire are a thing of the past. So he says, seven weeks since we moved out here, me, my wife, our two kids, uh, we wanted change. We wanted to get out of our comfort zone in Northampton. And so he says, business-wise, I jumped. I thought this was interesting before I was pushed. Mm -hmm. He says, how I was working in the UK was almost like a dirty drug. Do a bit of corporate, bit of media. It was always there. There was enough to keep you going and it was easy, but for me it wasn't a sustainable career choice. I enjoy doing a bit, but it's just a hobby now to stay connected with rugby and earn at the same time. I needed to take on the real world and that led me here working for Access Hire. So he's working for that company. It's like construction and oil and gas. 
and he also um, does some coaching for them as well he coaches rugby teams on uh, Tuesday and Thursday so it's kind of best of both worlds for him and so he says uh, talks of retirement been very difficult he retired second child lockdown started renovating my house paying builders bills my salary just stopped I had a payout agreed and signed with Northampton but because of Covid they said they couldn't pay it so we settled on 50% of what we'd agreed I had no income and I was like every other self-employed person at home during the pandemic. And he made, I think, a very self-aware point as well. He refers to his post-rugby life as a dirty drug again. I wanted to get away from that dirty drug, cut ties from rugby in a way, and not get stuck in that downward cycle of being an irrelevant sportsman. Let's be honest, unless you're Martin Johnson or Johnny Wilkinson, you have a couple of years and then your value drops. When Jamie George retires and they need a hooker for TV... (coughs) I'm not the guy they'll be calling. I suspect there's a lot of former uh, players, former rugby players who would read those kind of lines and think, yeah, I mean, I've had similar thoughts myself. Yeah, and I think, you know, the... the, the like, first of all, I've, I've played against him and met him lots of times. And this, this, you know, to see him this honest is great. OK, I hadn't had that experience with him before. Um, and maybe just because I hadn't spent enough time with him. But I um, just the honesty is great. But also, he's a former England captain. Mm. Right. Um, so to say this is post or this is what a retirement looks like is even generous, right? Because, you know, he's had media opportunities in corporates that are, you know, far above what, what most players retiring will have. But it's still really challenging. I mean, that's clear how honest he is and how tough it's been for him. Um, and I think it's one of the best pieces I've read or that's explained probably the conversations I'd have with people on a one-on-one, you know, who've retired. It probably just sums it up really, really well. There's no there's no rubbish in it. It's, no. it's just dead straight. It's, it's as it is. Um, and he captures, he really captures the piece around, you know, how much media should you do when you finish? Like, it's really interesting, right? How, like, you know, are you actually, you know, how, how long will it actually keep you happy for? Um, is it helping you? Is it actually helping you uh, transition? Is it hurting your transition? Um, it's interesting to read. Uh, I thought it was very, very honest and, and a great point. Because he said he had just enough to keep going, enough mm. corporate work, enough media to mm. sort of keep his hand in. But mm. as he said himself, I'm just waiting for the next uh, high-profile hooker or England captain to retire and then suddenly I'm yesterday's man. And I would think a lot of players who get their initial burst of punditry and then slowly, they either do very well, but there's a sink or swim quality and the name recognition and the recency only gets them so yeah. far. And it's interesting as well, because like you say, Owen, he's the former England captain. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And if he's if he's looking at it in that stark terms and you're thinking, what's it like further down the pyramid? And what I thought of when he was reading it was um, asking Gary Neville spoken in the past about how his shelf life is going to be. Now, not because he thinks it's a shelf life, but because he just thinks recency is another issue as well. I mean, how relevant can he be 10 years after retiring yeah. or 15? He says, there will come a point when I will walk away from it. Now, I haven't heard him say that recently, so maybe he... He still loves it, but there is that point. Mm. Um, you know, the further you get away from the, from the game, I, I think Brian O'Driscoll has spoken about it as well, that you have to keep talking to people in the game and, you know, what's happening, you know, what's happening in training, what are the big trends in the game, stuff like that. So, it, you know, it is difficult. And your point, on is very interesting. Does that actually help or hinder you mm. when you finish the game? You know, it's basically, is it cold turkey or is it... Mm. Is, would cold turkey be better for you or, or do you kind of ease yourself out of it? And I suppose that's different for, for everybody really, isn't it? It is. And, and, and the things that jump up and down in front of you like that are attracting you are all going to be stuff you can yeah. do now. So it will be uh, media, TV, it will be rugby, right? It yeah. won't be, you know, Dubai, right? It won't be a access list in Dubai, which he's yeah. obviously had to dig for, he's had to think about it and he's had to try and find his way into something else, which... You know, if he hadn't been England captain, would have probably had to face up that earlier because he wouldn't have survived right mm-hmm. without the corporates and the TV. Um, but I thought it was a very good article, and you know, he, he does get into the the concussion side of yeah. it as well. You know, I would have I would have gladly read the whole article about him after rugby, and preferred to have read part two, Dylan Hartley on concussion next week. Mm. That's how good the first third of it is. Mm. I, yeah. It's a brilliant, brilliant read. And the, the second third is brilliant as well. It is, yeah. We'll come to that in a second. And I presume your sense of talking to players one-on-one on is, is that they're acutely aware that there'll be an initial burst of offers when they first retire and then it'll go very, very quiet. Or do they do they almost think, oh, well, maybe this is just what post-life is going to be? <sighs> it's like the, the kind of... the the 
you know, the affirmation or the positivity will come from these opportunities. You know, like it'll be it'll be media driven, it'll be corporate driven. So you won't be told you're great at your new job, right? Because you're not great at your new job. So that's going to take a long time of work and toil, like you had to do with the start of the rugby. But the yeah. easy win is the is is people. So people don't notice it. Um, would be what I'd say. I don't think they do. They're aware of it. But I, I'd say, have me now the game. You know, I used to say, oh, maybe 60, 70 perceived for life. At this stage, I would say I haven't met a single player who, who, who has retired who hasn't found it challenging. Yeah, of course. And that goes from captains of Ireland, mm. captains of England in the paper today, to people who had to retire at 21 with, with you know, a sudden injury. You yes. Know. You went straight into the business world, didn't you? I did, yeah, yeah. And was that the plan for quite some time before retirement? Uh, it was on the cards, yeah. And and the last year were, was, was uh, you know, kind of, will I, won't I? Like, I had another year to go almost. Like, there was another year I could have played on. Right. Which meant that the, the, the leaving bit was like, you know, I didn't... Instead of thinking, oh, someone's let me go, I, I had a distinct feeling of, have I let somebody down, right? Because I decided in June to not play in September. So, like that does give you a different feeling when you're finishing because you're, you're, you've a compassionate feeling as opposed to thinking you're, you're someone's after doing a job on you, you know what I mean? Um, but then, you know, I think it's been, it's been, for me, there's a different phases. Like, the, the, I probably had a, in what I was trying to do, I felt so far kind of, it's, it felt like such a, another mountain to climb as in how difficult it was going to be. It gave me a similar actual motivation that I have with the rugby like, right you know what I mean um, and as I do that longer and longer now like that's interesting how the rest of my life fits into it to, to a week now right like you can't always be around winning winning you know as it was European Cup or you know so it's it's uh, I think I'm in another phase now than I hadn't been for the first for the first few years mm. so he goes on to talk about uh, the issue I suppose most rugby players of his age are, are concerned about and uh, he says, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting his approach to his health now. So he said, I'm 90% fine when it comes to concussion or potential dementia. He said, I'm 90% fine, but there are a few one percenters that keep me in check. A little bit of dizziness and the odd stutter and dropping things. So he says, part of this journey of moving to Dubai is to get a new lease of life, to get sun in my face, wake up warm so my joints aren't creaking. I want to lose some wrinkles so my daughter stops saying I look so old. Uh, it wasn't right for me and my family to join the group action because he was asked to join the group action. And his, his rationale was, I don't want to be in that um, headspace, no pun intended, of, of negativity, in effect. He said, I don't want to spend your whole day talking and thinking about deteriorating or forgetting your kids' names, etc. How is that going to make you feel? Instead, I sat down with my wife. I said, what can we do to get a, ahead of what's around the corner? Research says eat well, uh, drink less, train more, enjoy time with kids, get more oxygen to the brain, get your financial house in order so you can sleep well at night, have a daily purpose. I'd rather do that and approach things positively <coughs> than sit around waiting and worrying. As soon as I put it out of sight and out of mind, the world opened up again. I gave myself a schedule, even if it was getting out of the house one day a week to play golf. I removed the negativity of worrying about dementia and I feel better for it. Those guys that uh, have, have, they have to do their thing, he said. Those guys have got to do their thing. Good on them. And I support them and I support what they're doing from afar, but I need to find my own way. And interestingly, though, he has gone to uh, a clinic out in Dubai and they treat traumatic brain injuries. He has booked himself in for an assessment which included uh, multiple scans and tests. And now he's going to have a three-month uh, treatment therapy which will um, get oxygen to the brain. So he's going to spend hours in a pressurised chamber to see if it will combat the impacts of his rugby career. And he says, I'm doing my uh, rehab, so I'm, I'm in the best possible place in 10 years. Because I don't know if you saw that Steve Thompson documentary the other week, but certainly uh, they didn't go into detail on it. But one of the cutaways uh, while he was just talking, generally being interviewed over it, was him with like an oxygen mask on in his house and was obviously... So one of the treatments seems to be getting oxygen... Mm -hmm. To the brain, so Dylan Hartley is doing something similar, I, 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 and that's me speculating a touch, but it sounds uh, similar to what we saw Steve Thompson doing. And he does say with the brain scans, it would be nice to have something to compare it with, like when I was 18 versus uh, now. But he's going to do this therapy program, get oxygen to the brain, and he said, uh, "Come back to me in a few months if you want, and we'll do an interview, and we'll we'll see if there's results." Um, but look, he tells the same war stories. Uh, 2011, I smashed into Keen Healy's knee in the Heineken Cup final. I had a massive lump in my head. We went in at half time with one hand on the trophy. Then I went into the toilets and this weird thing came over me. I just started crying, breaking down. 
That, along with the massive lump in my forehead, was a clear sign of a knock. I played the second half. I can't remember it. Mm. That's your era. Mm, Quite yeah. literally. Yeah, and and the start and there's another line which goes on about you know older hookers headbutting him as he as yeah. he uh, I mean which I remember that happening you know and you're just thinking God thank God I don't play in that position at the time I mean this was before they uh, engage in the scrum yeah. Yeah. if people didn't read it he said the other hooker who didn't name him would mm. make eye contact with him mm. and headbutt him mm. yeah but Hartley says well it scared the holy shit out of me yeah. so mm. when I got to mm. Elder statesmen, I started doing it to young lads too. So, like this vicious cycle, obviously yeah. they don't engage in the same way now. Yeah, but, uh. um, yeah. Look, it's it's scary, right? Um, and uh, there's a lot to go here still, right? In terms of what's going to come out of it, and, and and how how much sport, how much safer we can make the sport. Um, you know, there has been a lot of progress made. I mean, things like that just wouldn't, obviously, I mean, like, the, even the thought, even the, how crazy that feels now, you know, like, you you wonder five years from now when you look back at now, what will be the, the headbutt in the scrum moment? Mm. Um, but the game has to get safer all the time or or there won't be enough people playing it, right? He, he mentions the gladiatorial element to it, um, and he's right, OK? Um, people do love that, but you just won't have the numbers playing, and rightly so, if the game doesn't continue to get safer as we go on. Mm. It's very interesting as well that he's talking about what can be done to, to help players and this, this marries both parts of the article, the, the the retirement aspect and the concussion and you know how players are physically after it and he's talking about creating a fund for retired players which seems like um, a very simple thing to do, make every player contribute 1% from the day they signed the first contract and it all goes into a big pot and I, I, off the top of my head I, I, I would say there's definitely a fund like that in the GA I, I think I'm aware of. Right. I'm sure soccer would have him. I'm kind of shocked that, you know, what that that clearly wasn't there in your day playing for Wasps even. But it seems like a very yeah simple thing it does. to do. And he mentioned another one there where, like, you know, when you finish at a club, yeah. open up the physio once a week. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, uh, that would be a great thing, yeah. right? It really would. Um, he does, and he's had some good ideas. To be fair to him, he does. Um, he is. Yeah, 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 he has. Yeah. Um, so there's loads of small things like that that can be done. Because he you says know? as well, and this came up in the Steve Thompson uh, documentary, he's talking about brain scans. So he said, if you injure your knee um, and you're a marquee player international, they'll send you straight away for an MRI because uh, cost, he said, is the reason why every player isn't getting a head scan. That's an easy first step. And one of the conversations Steve Thompson was having with uh, a couple of his former teammates in the documentary was like, uh, the cost of yeah. brain scans is so exorbitant mm. that clubs are a little bit going on the cheap on this and, and maybe not everyone who could have done with one was getting one at all mm. times. Mm. It's also as well, I know, I think you guys had uh, Dr. Michael Collins in yeah. there, didn't you? I went to that um, UPMC uh, concussion mm. conference in, in UCD at the time yeah. and there's myself and a couple of the other print lads there and I wouldn't be overly, you know, au fait with it, but I have covered it off and on down the years. Yeah. And some of the stuff he was saying at that conference just just took me absolutely by surprise and because it, it just you made me think of it there because he's talking about the MRI and an injury and Dr Collins was saying like you know all our traditional thinking about concussion was go into a dark room pull the curtains don't do anything he says hold on every other injury you have to rehab it mm. you have to stress test mm. it a little bit and he's saying that's what we're doing with the brain now and it just made me think I mean I went to their first conference in Dublin in 2016 and the change in what they were saying then and now, and he, he gave us a great line at one stage, he said, we started this in 09 or whatever, and he said, I would hate to see a tape of what we were saying in 09. Yes. So it just shows the stratospheric yeah. graph in what they're doing. And 09 is like you were at the height yeah, of your yeah, career, yeah, like it's not yeah. that long ago either. Mm. Um, but all these ideas are very good that he's talking about. He was, he's, he's out in Pittsburgh and he's yeah. a like, world-renowned expert and treats thousands of people a year. And he was, because all we've had is doom and gloom on this issue. Yeah. And if you want to watch it on YouTube or you know any former players listening, he would give you a real sense of optimism that this is very treatable. Okay. Now yeah. look, when it gets in, I asked him, what about the world when dementia starts? No one's yeah. treating that very well. He said, yeah. look, that's, that's trickier. But just those concussion symptoms even something like um, the second one can be less serious if the first one is treated well, properly yeah you know which which like you say is such a huge kind of oh you kind of can breathe yeah. a little bit of relief it's some potentially good news in this situation like you know so it's it's, it's it was an interesting one and I don't know it'd be interesting to watch I'm gonna watch it going forward but Peter O'Reilly it's actually a different type of story he's talking about James Cronin yeah 
but he's he's covering um, the fact that we were stuck for a loose head um, in New cover in New Zealand. Yeah. But he refers to uh, a brain injury. So he, he says, uh, who was it that was missing from that test? Jeremy Lockman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because he suffered from a brain injury. And I thought, I have never, like, normally that's HIA, mm. concussion, you know, and when I read it, it jumped out at me. I was thinking, that's actually a very good way of, of reporting this. It does sound a lot more serious. It cuts through it, doesn't it? It, it does cut through it, you know, and, 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 and it brings, like you mentioned it there, even about scans, like it brings the same ideas around, you know, hamstring injury, knee injury, like they're, they're scans, you know, every straight away, every time. Yeah. Um, but I found that quite uh, jarring to, to read, you know, this guy's coming back after a brain injury, which is what he's yeah. doing, yeah. right? Yeah. But, Brain damage is right next door to it, really, mm. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Hartley to play against. He's mouthy and like. Uh, oh yeah. Rub, he's, rub lads up the wrong like way. He, he's, uh, you know, he's clearly well educated, well read, smart guy. You know, um, but when he played, he likes you to think he was probably the opposite, right? right. Uh, he got in a lot of trouble. <laughs> like I played the against them uh, for was. I think he gouged two players in the same game and was banned for twenty-two weeks or nearly a full season. Yeah. Right. He um, he was a tough, tough cookie to play against, Jim. And yeah. even even his, his persona, he says, I was Eddie Jones's messenger. Looking back, maybe I would have done things a bit differently, smiled a bit more. It's liberating to be myself now yeah. and be honest, start fresh. And he was, wasn't he? He was pretty yeah, honest yeah. the whole way through yeah. that interview there. You know, it was a great interview. Yeah. Yeah. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Whatever you grow, we'll save a bro.